privacy law, not the concept of collusion. In so doing, the office recognized that the word collude was used in communications with the acting attorney general confirming certain aspects of the investigation's scope, and that the term has frequently been invoked in public reporting about the investigation. But collusion is not a specific offense or theory of liability found in the United States Code, nor is it a term of art in federal criminal law. For those reasons, the office's focus in analyzing questions of joint criminal liability was on conspiracy as defined in federal law. In connection with that analysis, we address the factual question whether members of the Trump campaign coordinated a term that appears in the appointment order with Russian election interference activities. Like collusion, coordination does not have a settled definition in federal criminal law. We understood coordination to require an agreement, tacit or express, between the Trump campaign and the Russian government on election interference. That requires more than the two parties taking actions that were informed or responsive to the other's actions or interests. We applied the term coordination in that sense when stating in the report that the investigation did not establish that the Trump campaign coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. The report on our investigation consists of two volumes. Volume one describes the factual results of the special counsel's investigation of Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election and its interactions with the Trump campaign. Section one of that volume describes the scope of the investigation. Sections two and three describe the principal ways Russia interfered in the 2016 presidential election. Section four describes links between the Russian, government's, Russian government and individuals associated with the Trump campaign. Section five sets forth the special counsel's charging decisions. Volume two addresses the president's actions toward the FBI's investigation into Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election and related matters, and his actions toward the special counsel's investigation. Volume two separately states its framework and the considerations that guided that investigation. Executive summary to volume one, Russian social media campaign. The Internet Research Agency, IRA, carried out the earliest Russian interference operations identified by the investigation, a social media campaign designed to provoke and amplify political and social discard in the United States. The IRA was based in St. Petersburg, Russia, and received funding from the Russian oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin and companies he controlled. Prigozhin is widely reported to have ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin. There's then a redacted section. In mid-2014, the IRA sent employees to the United States on an intelligence gathering mission with instructions redacted. The IRA later used social media accounts and interest groups to sow discord in the US political system through what it termed information warfare. The campaign involved from a generalized program designed in 2014 and 2015 to undermine the US electoral system to a targeted operation that by early 2016 favored candidate Trump and disparaged candidate Clinton. The IRA's operation also included the purchase of political advertisements on social media in the names of US persons and entities, as well as the staging of political rallies inside the United States. To organize those rallies, IRA employees posed as US grassroots entities and persons and made contact with Trump supporters and Trump campaign officials in the United States. The investigation did not identify evidence that any US persons conspired or coordinated with the IRA. Section two of this report details the office's investigation of the Russian social media campaign. Russian hacking operations. At the same time that the IRA operation began to focus on supporting candidate Trump in early 2016, the Russian government employed a second form of interference, cyber intrusions, hacking, and releases of hacked materials damaging to the Clinton campaign. The Russian intelligence service, known as the main intelligence directorate of the general staff of the Russian army, the GRU, carried out these operations. 
In March 2016, the GRU began hacking the email accounts of Clinton campaign volunteers and employees, including campaign chairman John Podesta. In April 2016, the GRU hacked into the computer networks of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the DCCC, and the Democratic National Committee, the DNC. The GRU stole hundreds of thousands of documents from the compromised email accounts and networks. Around the time that the DNC announced in mid-June 2016 the Russian government's role in hacking its network, the GRU began disseminating stolen materials through fictitious online personas, DC Leaks and Guccifer 2.0. The GRU later re released additional materials through the organization WikiLeaks. The presidential campaign of Donald J. Trump, the Trump campaign or campaign, showed interest in WikiLeaks releases of documents and welcomed their potential to damage candidate Clinton. Beginning in June 2016, redacted, senior campaign officials that WikiLeaks would release information damaging to candidate Clinton. WikiLeaks' first release came in June, July 2016. Around the same time, candidate Trump announced that he hoped Russia would recover emails described as missing from a private server used by Clinton when she was Secretary of State. He later said that he was speaking sarcastically. Redacted. WikiLeaks began releasing Podesta's stolen emails on October 7th, 2016, less than one hour after a U.S. media outlet released video considered damaging to candidate Trump. Section three of this report details the office's investigation into the Russian hacking operations, as well as other efforts by Trump campaign supporters to obtain Clinton-released emails. Russian contacts with the campaign. The social media campaign and the GRU hacking operations coincided with a series of contacts between Trump campaign officials and individuals with ties to the Russian government. The office investigated whether those contacts reflected or resulted in the campaign conspiring or coordinating with Russia in its election and interference activities. Although the investigation established that the Russian government perceived it would benefit from a Trump presidency and worked to secure that outcome, and the campaign expected it would benefit electorally from information stolen and released through Russian efforts, the investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government in its election interference activities. The Russian contacts consisted of business connections, offers of assistance to the campaign, invitations for candidate Trump and Putin to meet in person, invitations for campaign officials and representatives of the Russian government to meet, and policy positions seeking improved U.S.-Russian relations. Section 4 of the report details the contacts between Russia and the Trump campaign during the campaign and transition periods, the most salient of which are summarized below in chronological order. 2015. Some of the earliest contacts were made in connection with a Trump Organization real estate project in Russia known as Trump Tower Moscow. Candidate Trump signed a letter of intent for Trump Tower Moscow by November 2015. And in January 2016, Trump Organization Executive Michael Cohen emailed and spoke about the project with the Office of Russian Government Press Secretary, Dmitry Peskov. The Trump Organization pursued the project through at least June 2016, including by considering travel to Russia by Cohen and candidate Trump. Spring 2016. Campaign foreign policy advisor George Papadopoulos made early contact with Joseph Mifsud, a London-based professor who had connections to Russia and traveled to Moscow in April 2016. Immediately upon his return to London from that trip, Mifsud told Papadopoulos that the Russian government had dirt on Hillary Clinton in the form of thousands of emails. One week later, in the first week of May 2016, Papadopoulos suggested to a representative of a foreign government that the Trump campaign had received indications from the Russian government that it could assist the campaign through the anonymous release of information damaging to candidate Clinton. Throughout that period of time and for several months thereafter, Papadopoulos worked with Mifsud and two Russian nationals to arrange a meeting between the campaign and the Russian government. No meeting took place. Summer 2016. 
Russian outreach to the Trump campaign continued into the summer of 2016 as candidate Trump was becoming the presumptive Republican nominee for president. On June 9, 2016, for example, a Russian lawyer met with senior campaign, Trump campaign officials Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and campaign chairman Paul Manafort to deliver what the email proposing the meeting had described as official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary. The materials were offered to Trump Jr. as, quote, part of Russia and its government support for Mr. Trump, end quote. The written communication setting up the meeting showed that the campaign anticipated receiving information from Russia that could assist candidate Trump's electoral prospects, but the Russian lawyer's presentation did not provide such information. Days after the June 9 meeting, on June 14, 2016, a cybersecurity firm and the DNC announced that Russian government hackers had infiltrated the DNC and obtained access to opposition research on candidate Trump, among other documents. In July 2016, campaign foreign policy advisor Carter Page traveled in his personal capacity to Moscow and gave the keynote address at the New Economic School. Page had lived and worked in Russia between 2003 and 2007. After returning to the United States, Page became acquainted with at least two Russian intelligent officers, one of whom was later charged in 2015 with conspiracy to act as an unregistered agent of Russia. Page's July 2016 trip to Moscow and his advocacy for pro-Russian foreign policy drew media attention. The campaign then distanced itself from Page and by late September 2016 removed him from the campaign. July 16 was also the month WikiLeaks first released emails stolen by the GRU from the DNC. On July 22, 2016, WikiLeaks posted thousands of internal DNC documents revealing information about the Clinton campaign. Within days, there was public reporting that U.S. intelligence agencies had high confidence that the Russian government was behind the theft of emails and documents from the DNC. And within a week of the release, a foreign government informed the FBI about its May 2016 interaction with Papadopoulos and his statement that the Russian government could assist the Trump campaign. On July 31, 2016, based on the foreign government reporting, the FBI opened an investigation into potential coordination between the Russian government and individuals associated with the Trump campaign. Separately, on August 2, 2016, Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort met in New York City with his longtime business associate, Konstantin Kalimnik, who the FBI assesses to have ties to Russian intelligence. Kalimnik requested the meeting to deliver in person a peace plan for the Ukraine that Manafort acknowledged to the special counsel's office was a backdoor way for Russia to control part of eastern Ukraine. Both men believed the plan would require candidate Trump's assent to succeed were he elected to be president. They also discussed the status of the Trump campaign and Manafort's strategy for winning Democratic votes in Midwestern states. Months before that meeting, Manafort had caused internal polling data to be shared with Kalimnik, and the sharing continued for some period of time after their August meeting. Fall 2016. On October 7, 2016, the media released video of candidate Trump speaking in graphic terms about women years earlier, which was considered damaging to his candidacy. Less than an hour later, WikiLeaks made its second release. Thousands of John Podesta's emails that had been stolen by the GRU in late March 2016. The FBI and other U.S. government institutions were at the time continuing their investigation of suspected Russian government efforts to interfere in the presidential election. That same day, October 7, the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence issued a joint public statement that the Russian government directed the recent compromises of emails from U.S. persons and institutions, including from U.S. political organizations. Those thefts and the disclosures of the hacked materials through online platforms such as WikiLeaks, the statement continued, are intended to interfere with the U.S. election process. Post-2016 election. Immediately after the November 8 election, Russian government officials and prominent Russian businessmen began trying to make inroads into the new administration. The most senior levels of the Russian government encouraged these efforts. 
The Russian embassy made contact hours after the election to congratulate the president-elect and to arrange a call with President Putin. Several Russian businessmen picked up the effort from there. Kirill Dmitriev, the chief executive officer of Russia's sovereign wealth fund, was among the Russians who tried to make contact with the incoming administration. In early December, a business associate steered Dmitriev to Eric Prince, a supporter of the Trump campaign, and an associate of senior Trump advisor Steve Bannon. Dmitriev and Prince later met face-to-face -face in January 2017 in the Seychelles and discussed U.S.-Russia relations. During the same period, another business associate introduced Dmitriev to a friend of Jared Kushner, who had not served on the campaign or the transition team. Dmitriev and Kushner's friend collaborated on a short written reconciliation plan for the United States and Russia, which Dmitriev implied had been cleared through Putin. The friend gave that proposal to Kushner before the inauguration, and Kushner later gave copies to Bannon and incoming Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. On December 29, 2016, then-President Obama imposed sanctions on Russia for having interfered in the election. Incoming National Security Advisor Michael Flynn called Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak and asked that Russia not to ask Russia not to escalate the situation in response to the sanctions. The following day, Putin announced that Russia would not take retaliatory measures in response to the sanctions at that time. Hours later, President-elect Trump tweeted, great move on delay by V. Putin. The next day, on December 31, 2016, Kislyak called Flynn and told him the request had been received at the highest levels and Russia had chosen not to retaliate as a result of Flynn's request. On January 6, 2017, members of the Intelligence Committee community briefed President-elect Trump on a joint assessment drafted and coordinated among the Central Intelligence Agency, FBI, and National Security Agency that concluded with high confidence that Russia had intervened in the election through a variety of means to assist Trump's candidacy and harm Clinton's. A declassified version of that assessment was publicly released the same day. Between mid-January 2017 and early February 2017, three congressional committees, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, HIPSI, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, SSCI, and the Senate Judiciary Committee, SJC, announced they would conduct inquiries or had already been conducting inquiries into Russian interference in the election. Then FBI Director James Comey later confirmed to Congress the existence of the FBI's investigation into Russian interference that had begun before the election. On March 20, 2017, in open session testimony before HIPSI, Comey stated, I have been authorized by the Department of Justice to confirm that the FBI, as part of our counterintelligence mission, is investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election, and that includes investigating the nature of any links between individuals associated with the Trump campaign and the Russian government, and whether there was any coordination between the campaign and Russia's efforts. As with any counterintelligence investigation, this will also include an assessment of whether any crimes were committed. The investigation continued under then-Director Comey for the next seven weeks until May 9, 2017, when President Trump fired Comey as FBI director, an action which is analyzed in Volume 2 of the report. On May 17, 2017, Acting Attorney General Rod Rosenstein appointed the special counsel and authorized him to conduct the investigation that Comey had confirmed in his congressional testimony, as well as matters arising directly from the investigation and any other matters within the scope of 28 CFR section 600.4A, which generally covers efforts to interfere with or obstruct the investigation. President Trump reacted negatively to the special counsel's appointment. He told advisors that it was the end of his presidency sought to have Attorney General Jefferson Jeff Sessions unrecused from the Russia investigation and to have the special counsel removed and engaged in efforts to curtail the special counsel's investigation and prevent the disclosure of evidence to it, including through public and private contacts with potential witnesses. Those and related actions are described and analyzed in volume two of the report. 
the special counsel's charging decisions. In reaching the charging decisions described in volume one of the report, the office determined whether the conduct it found amounted to a violation of federal criminal law chargeable under the principles of federal prosecution. See Justice Manual Section 9-27 at SEC 2018. The standard set forth in the Justice Manual is whether the conduct constitutes a crime. If so, whether admissible evidence would probably be sufficient to obtain and sustain a conviction and whether prosecution would serve a substantial federal interest that could not adequately be served by prosecution elsewhere or through non-criminal alternatives. See Justice Manual Section 9-27.220. Section 5 of the report provides detailed explanation of the office's charging decisions, which contain three main components. First, the office determined that Russia's two principal interference operations in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, the social media campaign and the hacking and dumping operations, violated U.S. criminal law. Many of the individuals and entities involved in the social media campaign have been charged with participating in a conspiracy to defraud the United States by undermining through deceptive acts the work of federal agencies charged with regulating foreign influence in U.S. elections as well as related counts of identity theft. C, United States versus Internet Research Agency et al., number 18-CR-32, DDC. Separately, Russian intelligence officers who carried out the hacking into Democratic Party computers and the personal email accounts of individuals affiliated with the Clinton campaign conspired to violate, among other federal laws, the Federal Computer Intrusion Statute, and they have been so charged. See United States versus Netishko et al. Number 18-CR-215, DDC. Then there's a redacted portion. Second, while the investigation identified numerous links between individuals with ties to the Russian government and individuals associated with the Trump campaign, the evidence was not sufficient to support criminal charges. Among other things, the evidence was not sufficient to charge any campaign official as an unregistered agent of the Russian government or other Russian principal. And our evidence about the June 9, 2016 meeting and the WikiLeaks, rele WikiLeaks releases of hacked materials was not sufficient to charge a criminal campaign finance violation. Further, the evidence was not sufficient to charge that any member of the Trump campaign conspired with representatives of the Russian government to interfere in the 2016 election. Third, the investigation established that several individuals affiliated with the Trump campaign lied to the office and to Congress about their interactions with Russia-affiliated individuals in related matters. Those lies materially impacted the investigation of Russian election interference. The office charged some of those lies as violations of the federal false statement statute. Former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying about his interactions with Russian Ambassador Kislyak during the transition period. George Papadopoulos, a foreign policy advisor during the campaign period, pleaded guilty to lying to investigators about, inter alia, the nature and timing of his interactions with Joseph Mifsud, the professor who told Papadopoulos that the Russians had dirt on candidate Clinton in the form of thousands of emails. Former Trump Organization attorney Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to making false statements to Congress about the Trump Moscow project. Then there's a redacted portion. And in February 2019, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia found that Manafort lied to the office and the grand jury concerning his interactions and communications with Konstantin Kalimnik about the Trump campaign polling data and a peace plan for Ukraine. The office investigated several other events that have been publicly reported to involve potential Russia-related contacts. For example, the investigation established that interactions between Russian Ambassador Kislyak and Trump campaign officials, both at the candidate's April 2016 foreign policy speech in Washington, D.C., and during the week of the Republican National Convention, were brief, public, and non-substantive. And the investigation did not establish that one campaign of official's efforts to dilute a portion of the Republican Party platform on providing assistance to Ukraine were undertaken at the behest of candidate Trump or Russia. The investigation also did not establish that a meeting between Kislyak and Sessions in September 2016 
at Sessions' Senate office included any more than a passing mention of the presidential campaign. The investigation did not always yield admissible information or testimony or a complete picture of the activities undertaken by the subjects of the investigation. Some individuals invoked their Fifth Amendment right against compelled self-incrimination and were not, in the office's judgment, appropriate candidates for grants of immunity. The office limited its pursuit of other witnesses' information, such as information known to attorneys or individuals claiming to be members of the media, in light of internal Department of Justice policies. CEG Justice Manual Sections 9-13400-13.410. Some of the information obtained via court process, moreover, was presumptively covered by legal privilege and was screened from investigators by a filter or taint team. Even when individuals testified or agreed to be interviewed, they sometimes provided information that was false or incomplete, leading to some of the false statement charges described above and the office faced practical limits on its ability to access relevant in evidence as well. Numerous witnesses and subjects lived abroad, and documents were held outside the United States. Further, the office learned that some of the individuals we interviewed or whose conduct we investigated, including some associated with the Trump campaign, deleted relevant communications or communicated during the relevant time period using applications that feature encryption or that do not provide for long-term retention of data or communications records. In such cases, the office was not able to corroborate witness statements through comparison to contemporaneous communications or fully question witnesses about statements that appeared inconsistent with other known facts. Accordingly, while this report embodies factual and legal determinations that the office believes to be accurate and complete to the greatest extent possible, Given these identified gaps, the office cannot rule out the possibility that the unavailable information would shed additional light on or cast in a new light the events described in the report. Section 1, the Special Counsel's Investigation. On May 17, 2017, Deputy Attorney General Rod J. Rosenstein, then serving as Acting Attorney General for the Russia investigation following the recusal of former Attorney General Jeff Sessions on March 2, 2016, appointed the special counsel to investigate Russian interference with the 2016 presidential election and related matters. Office of the Deputy Attorney General, Order Number 3915-2017, appointment of special counsel to investigate Russian interference with the 2016 presidential election and related matters, May 17, 2017, here and after called the appointment order. Relying on the authority vested in the Acting Attorney General, including 28 U.S.C. Sections 509, 510, and 515, the Acting Attorney General ordered the appointment of a special counsel in order to discharge the Acting Attorney General's responsibility to provide supervision and management of the Department of Justice and to ensure a full and thorough investigation of the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. Appointment order introduction. The special counsel, the order stated, is authorized to conduct the investigation confirmed by then FBI Director James B. Comey in testimony before the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence on May 20, 2017, including, number one, any links or coordination between the Russian government and individuals associated with the campaign of President Donald Trump, and number two, any matters that arose or may arise directly from the investigation, and number three, any other matters within the scope of 28 CFR section 600.4A, appointment order paragraph B. Section 600.4 affords the special counsel the authority to investigate and prosecute federal crimes committed in the course of and with the intent to interfere with the special counsel's investigation, such as perjury, obstruction of justice, destruction of evidence, and intimidation of witnesses, 28 CFR section 600.4A. The authority to investigate any matters that arose directly from the investigation, appointment order paragraph B2, covers similar, similar crimes that may have occurred during the course of the FBI's confirmed investigation before the special counsel's appointment. If the special counsel believes it is necessary and appropriate, the order further provided, the special counsel is authorized to prosecute federal crimes arising from the investigation of these matters. Id paragraph C. 
Finally, the Acting Attorney General made applicable Section 600.4 through 600.10 of Title 28 of the Code of Federal Regulations, id at paragraph D. The Acting Attorney General further clarified the scope of the Special Counsel's investigatory authority in two subsequent memoranda. A memorandum dated August 2, 2017, explained that the appointment order had been worded categorically in order to permit its public release without confirming specific investigations involving specific individuals. It then confirmed that the special counsel had been authorized since his appointment to investigate allegations that three Trump campaign officials, Carter Page, Paul Manafort, and George Papadopoulos, committed a crime or crimes by colluding with Russian government officials with respect to the Russian government's efforts to interfere with the 2016 presidential election. The memorandum also confirmed the special counsel's authority to investigate certain other matters, including two additional sets of allegations involving Manafort, crimes arising from payments he received from the Ukrainian government, and crimes arising from his receipt of loans from a bank whose CEO was then seeking a position in the Trump administration. Allegations that Papadopoulos committed a crime or crimes by acting as an unregistered agent of the Israeli government, and four sets of allegations involving Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor to President Trump. On October 20th, 2017, the acting attorney general confirmed in a memorandum the special counsel's investigative authority as to several individuals, individuals and entities. First, as part of a full and thorough investigation of the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election, the special counsel was authorized to investigate the pertinent activities of Michael Cohen, Richard Gates, redacted, Roger Stone, and redacted. Confirmation of that authorization to investigate such individuals, the memorandum stressed, does not suggest that the special counsel has made a determination that any of them has committed a crime. Second, with respect to Michael Cohen, the memorandum recognized the special counsel's authority to investigate leads related to Cohen's establishment and use of Essential Consultants LLC to, inter alia, receive funds from Russian-backed entities. Third, the memorandum memorialized the special counsel's authority to investigate individuals and entities who were possibly engaged in jointly undertaken activity with existing subjects of the investigation, including Paul Manafort. Finally, the memorandum described an FBI investigation open before the special counsel's appointment into allegations that then Attorney General Jeff Sessions made false statements to the United States Senate and confirmed the special counsel's authority to investigate that matter. The special counsel structured the investigation in view of his power and authority to exercise all investigative and prosecutorial functions of any United States attorney, 28 CFR 600.6. Like a U.S. Attorney's Office, the Special Counsel's Office considered a range of classified and unclassified information available to the FBI in the course of the Office's Russia investigation. And the Office structured that work around evidence for possible use in prosecutions of federal crimes, assuming that one or more crimes were identified that warranted prosecution. There was substantial evidence immediately available to the Special Counsel at the inception of the investigation in May 2017, because the FBI had, by that time, already investigated Russian election interference for nearly 10 months. The special counsel's office exercised its judgment regarding what to investigate and did not, for instance, investigate every public report of a contact between the Trump campaign and Russia-affiliated individuals and entities. Thank you very much. The office has concluded, the office has concluded its investigation into links and coordination between the Russian government and individuals associated with the Trump campaign. Certain proceedings associated with the office's work remain ongoing. After consultation with the office of the Deputy Attorney General, the office has transferred responsibility for those remaining issues to other components of the Department of Justice and FBI. Appendix D lists those transfers. Two district courts confirmed the breadth of the special counsel's authority to investigate Russia in election interference and links and or coordination with the Trump campaign. See United States versus Manafort, United States versus Manafort. 
In the course of conducting that investigation, the office periodically identified evidence of potential criminal activity that was outside the, that was outside the scope of the special counsel's authority established by the acting attorney general. After consultation with the office of the deputy attorney general, the office referred to that evidence to appropriate law enforcement authorities, principally other components of the Department of Justice, and to the FBI. Appendix D summarizes those referrals. To carry out the investigation and prosecution of the matters assigned to him, the special counsel assembled a team that at its high point included 19 attorneys, five of whom joined the office from private practice and 14 on detail or assigned from other Department of Justice components. These attorneys were assisted by a filter team of department lawyers and FBI personnel who screened materials obtained via court process for privileged information before turning those materials over to investigators. A support staff of three paralegals on detail from the department's antitrust division and an administrative staff of nine responsible for budget, finance, purchasing, human resources, records, facilities, security, information technology, and administrative support. The special counsel attorneys and the support staff were co-located co with and worked, si and worked alongside approximately 40 FBI agents, intelligence analysts, forensic accountants, a paralegal, and professional staff assigned by the FBI to assist the special counsel's investigation. Those assigned FBI employees remained under FBI supervision at all times. The matters on which they assisted were supervised by the special counsel. During its investigation, the office issued more than 2,800 subpoenas under the auspices of a grand jury sitting in the District of Columbia, executed nearly 500 search and seizure warrants, obtained more than 230 orders for communications records under 18 U.S.C. 2703D, obtained almost 50 orders authorizing use of pen registers, made 13 requests to foreign governments pursuant to mutual legal assistance treaties, and interviewed approximately 500 witnesses, including almost 80 before a grand jury. From its inception, the office recognized that its investigation could identify foreign intelligence and counterintelligence information relevant to the FBI's broader national security mission. FBI personnel who assisted the office established procedures to identify and convey such information to the FBI. The FBI's counterintelligence division met with the office regularly for that purpose for most of the office's tenure. For more than the past year, the FBI also embedded personnel at the office who did not work on the special counsel's investigation, but whose purpose was to review the results of the investigation and to send in writing summaries of foreign intelligence and counterintelligence information to FBI HQ and FBI field offices. These communications and other correspondence between the office and the FBI contain information derived from the investigation, not all of which is contained in this volume. This volume is a summary. It contains, in the office's judgment, that information necessary to account for the special counsel's prosecution and declination decisions and to describe the investigation's main factual results. <coughs> the first form of Russian election influence came principally from the Internet Research Agency, LLC IRA. a Russian organization funded by Evgeny Viktorovich Prigozhin and companies he controlled, including Concord Management and Consulting, LLC, and Concord Catering, collectively Concord. The IRA conducted social media operations targeted at large U.S. audiences with the goal of sowing discord in the U.S. political system. These operations constituted active measures a term that typically refers to operations conducted by Russian security services aimed at influencing the course of international affairs. The IRA and its employees began operations targeting the United States as early as 2014. Using fictitious U.S. personas, IRA employees operated social media accounts and group pages designed to attract U.S. audiences. These groups and accounts, which address divisive U.S. political and social issues, falsely claim to be controlled by U.S. activists. Over time, these social media accounts became a means to reach large U.S. audiences. IRA employees traveled to the United States in mid-2014 on an intelligence-gathering mission to obtain information and photographs for use in their social media posts. IRA employees posted derogatory information about a number of candidates in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. 
By early to mid-2016, IRA operations included supporting the Trump campaign and disparaging candidate Hillary Clinton. The IRA made various expenditures to carry on the, out these activities, including buying political advertisements on social media in the names of U.S. persons and entities. Some IRA employees posing as U.S. persons and without revealing their Russian association communicated electronically with individuals associated with the Trump campaign and with other political activists to seek to coordinate political activities, including the staging of political rallies. The investigation did not identify evidence that any U.S. persons knowingly or intentionally coordinated with the IRA's interference operation. By the end of the 2016 U.S. election, the IRA had the ability to reach millions of U.S. persons through their social media accounts. Multiple IRA-controlled Facebook groups and Instagram accounts had hundreds of thousands of U.S. participants. IRA-controlled Twitter accounts separately had tens of thousands of followers, including multiple U.S. political figures who retweeted IRA-created content. In November 2017, a Facebook representative testified that Facebook had identified 470 IRA-controlled Facebook accounts that collectively made 80,000 posts between January 2015 and August 2017. Facebook estimated the IRA reached as many as 126 million persons through its Facebook accounts. In January 2018, Twitter announced that it had identified 3,814 IRA-controlled Twitter accounts notified approximately 1.4 million people Twitter believed may have been in contact with the IRA-controlled accounts. A. Structure of the Internet Research Agency. Redacted. The organization quickly grew. Redacted. The growth of the organization also led to more detailed organizational structure. Redacted. Redacted. Two individuals headed the IRA's management its General Director, Mikhail Bistrov, and its Executive Director, Mikhail Birchik, redacted. As, er as early as the spring of 2014, the IRA began to hide its funding and activities, redacted. The IRA's U.S. operations are part of a larger set of interlocking operations known as Project Lachta, redacted. B, funding and oversight from Concord and Prigozhin. Until at least February 2018, Yevgeny Viktorovich Prigozhin and two Concord companies funded the IRA. Prigozhin is a wealthy Russian businessman who served as the head of Concord. Redacted. Prigozhin was sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury Department in December 2016. Redacted. Numerous media sources have reported on Prigozhin's ties to Putin, and the two have appeared together in public photographs. Redacted. 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 Redacted, 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 redacted. IRA employees were aware that Prigozhin was involved in the IRA's U.S. operations. Redacted. In May 2016, IRA employees claiming to be U.S. social activists and administrators of Facebook groups recruited U.S. persons to hold signs, including one in front of the White House that read, Happy, birth Happy, 50 50 Happy 55th Birthday, Dear Boss, as an homage to Prigozhin whose 55th birthday was on June 1, 2016. Redacted, redacted. C, the IRA targets U.S. elections. One, the IRA ramps up U.S. operations as early as 2014. The IRA's U.S. operations sought to influence public opinion through online media and forums. By the spring of 2014, the IRA began to consolidate U.S. operations within a single general department known internally as the Translator Department, redacted. IRA subdivided the Translator Department into different responsibilities, ranging from operations on different social media platforms to analytics to graphics and IT. Redacted, 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 redacted. IRA employees also traveled to the United States on intelligence-gathering missions. In June 2014, four IRA employees applied to the U.S. Department of State to enter the United States while lying about the purpose of their trip and claiming to be four friends who had met at a party. Ultimately, two IRA employees, Anna Bogacheva and Alexandra Krylova, received visas and entered the United States on June 4, 2014. Prior to traveling, Krylova and Bogacheva 
compiled itineraries and instructions for the trip. Redacted. Redacted. Two, U.S. operations through IRA-controlled social media accounts. Dozens of IRA employees were responsible for operating accounts and personas on different U.S. social media platforms. The IRA referred to employees assigned to operate their social media accounts as, quote, specialists. Starting as early as 2014, the IRA's U.S. operations included social media specialists focusing on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. The IRA later added specialists who operated on Tumblr and Instagram accounts. Initially, the IRA created social media accounts that pretended to be the personal accounts of U.S. persons. By early 2015, the IRA began to create larger social media groups or public social media pages that claimed falsely to be affiliated with U.S. political and grassroots organizations. In certain cases, the IRA created accounts that mimicked real U.S. organizations. For example, one IRA-controlled Twitter account at 10 GOP reported to be connected to the Tennessee Republican Party. More commonly, the IRA created accounts in the names of fictitious U.S. organizations and grassroots groups and used these accounts to pose as anti-immigration groups, Tea Party activists, Black Lives Matter protesters, and other U.S. social and political activists. The IRA closely monitored the activity of its social media accounts. Redacted, redacted, redacted. By February 2016, internal IRA documents referred to support for the Trump campaign in opposition to candidate Clinton. For example, redacted, directions to IRA operators, redacted. Main idea, use any opportunity to criticize Hillary Clinton and the rest except Sanders and Trump. We support them. Redacted. The focus on the U.S. presidential campaign continued throughout 2016. In redacted 2016, internal redacted, reviewing the, the IRA-controlled Facebook, Facebook group Secured Borders, the author criticized the lower number of posts dedicated to criticizing Hillary Clinton and reminded the Facebook specialists it is imperative to intensify criticism in criticizing Hillary Clinton. IRA employees also acknowledged that their work focused on influencing the U.S. presidential election. Redacted. Three, U.S. operations through Facebook. Many IRA operations use Facebook accounts created and operated by its specialists. Redacted, 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 redacted. IRA Facebook groups active during the 2016 campaign covered a range of political issues and included pr purported conservative groups with names such as Being Patriotic, Stop All Immigrants, Secured Borders, and Tea Party News, purported black social justice groups, Black America, Black Matters, Blacktivist, and Don't Shoot Us, LGBTQ groups, LGBT United, and religious groups, United Muslims of America. Throughout 2016, IRA accounts published an increasing number of materials supporting the Trump campaign and opposing the Clinton campaign. For example, on May 31, 2016, the operational account Matt Skyber began to privately message dozens of pro-Trump Facebook groups asking them to help plan a pro-Trump rally near Trump Tower. To reach larger U.S. audiences, the IRA purchased advertisements from Facebook that promised the IRA groups on the, that promoted the IRA groups on the news feeds of U.S. audience members. According to Facebook, the IRA purchased over 3,500 advertisements and the expenditures totaled approximately $100,000. During the U.S. presidential campaign, many IRA purchased advertisements explicitly supported or opposed the presidential candidate or promoted U.S. rallies organized by the IRA, discussed below. As early as March 2016, the IRA purchased advertisements that overtly opposed the Clinton campaign. For example, on March 18, 2016, the IRA purchased an advertisement depicting candidate Clinton and a caption that re read in part, quote, if one day God lets this liar into the White House as a president, that day would be a real national tragedy, close quote. Similarly, on April 6, 2016, the IRA purchased advertisements for its account Black Matters, calling for a flash mob of U.S. persons to, quote, uh, take a photo with Hillary Clinton or prison 2016 or no Hillary 2016. IRA purchased advertisements featuring Clinton were, with very few exceptions, negative. 
IRA purchased advertisements referring, referencing candidate Trump largely supported his campaign. The first known IRA advertisement explicitly endorsing the Trump campaign was purchased on April 19, 2016. The IRA bought an advertisement for its Instagram account, quote, Tea Party News, close quote, asking U.S. persons to help them, quote, make a patriotic team of young Trump supporters by uploading photos with the hashtag Kids for Trump. It's, in subsequent months, the IRA purchased dozens of advertisements supporting the Trump campaign, predominantly through the Facebook groups Being Patriotic, Stop All Invaders, and Secured Borders. Collectively, the IRA's social media accounts reach tens of millions of U.S. persons. Individual IRA social media accounts attracted hundreds of thousands of followers. For example, at the time they were deactivated by Facebook in mid-2017, the IRA's United Muslims of America Facebook group had over 300,000 followers. The Don't Shoot Us Facebook group had over 250,000 followers. The Being Patriotic Facebook group had over 200,000 followers, and the Secured Borders Facebook group had over 130,000 followers. According to Facebook, in total, the IRA-controlled accounts made over 80,000 posts before their descent deactivation in August 2017. And these posts reached at least 29 million U.S. persons and may have reached an estimated 126 million people. Four. U.S. operations through Twitter. A number of IRA employees assigned to the translated department served as Twitter specialists. Redacted. The IRA's Twitter operations involved two strategies. First, IRA specialists operated certain Twitter accounts to create individual U.S. personas. Redacted. Separately, the IRA operated a network of automated Twitter accounts commonly referred to as a bot network, that enabled the IRA to amplify existing content on Twitter. A, individualized accounts. Redacted. The IRA operated individualized Twitter accounts similar to the operation of its Facebook accounts by continuously posting original content to the accounts while also communicating with U.S. Twitter users directly through public tweeting or Twitter's private messages. The IRA used many of these accounts to attempt to influence U.S. audiences on the election. Individualized accounts used to influence the U.S. presidential election included uh, hashtag 10GOP, described above, hashtag Jen Abrams, claiming to be a Virginian Trump supporter with 70,000 followers, hashtag Pamela Moore 13, claiming to be a Texan Trump supporter with 70,000 followers, and hashtag America First, an anti-immigration persona with 24,000 followers. In May 2016, the IRA created the Twitter accounts, hashtag March for Trump, which promoted IRA organized rallies in support of the Trump campaign baseball team. Using these accounts and others, the IRA provoked reactions from users in the media. Multiple IRA posted tweets gained popularity. U.S. media outlets also quoted tweets from IRA-controlled accounts and attributed them to the reactions of real U.S. persons. Similarly, numerous high-profile U.S. persons, including former Ambassador Michael McFaul, Roger Stone, Sean Hannity, and Michael Flynn Jr., retweeted or responded to tweets posted to these IRA-controlled accounts. Multiple individuals affiliated with the Trump campaign also promoted IRA tweets, discussed below. B, IRA botnet activities. Redacted, redacted, redacted. In January 2018, Twitter publicly identified 3,814 Twitter accounts associated with the IRA. According to Twitter, in the 10 weeks before the 2016 U.S. presidential election, these accounts posted approximately 175,993 tweets. Quote, approximately 8.4% of which were were election-related, close quote. Twitter also announced that it had notified approximately 1.4 million people who Twitter believed may have been in contact with an IRA-controlled account. Five, U.S. operations involving political rallies. 
The IRA organized and promoted political rallies inside the United States while posing as U.S. grassroots activists. First, the IRA used one of its pre-existing social media personas, Facebook groups and Twitter accounts, for example, to announce and promote the event. The IRA then sent a large number of direct messages to followers of its social media account asking them to attend the event. From those who responded with interest in attending, the IRA then sought a U.S. person to serve as the event's coordinator. In most cases, the IRA account operator would tell the U.S. person that they personally could not attend the event due to some pre-existing conflict or because they were somewhere else in the United States. The IRA then further promoted the event by contacting U.S. media about the event and directing them to speak with the coordinator. And after the event, the IRA posted videos and photographs of the event to the IRA's social media accounts. The office identified dozens of U.S. rallies organized by the IRA. The earliest evidence of a rally was a, quote, Confederate rally, unquote, in November of 2015. The IRA continued to organize rallies even after the 2016 U.S. presidential election. The attendance at rallies varied. The rallies, some rallies, appeared to have drawn few, if any, participants, while others drew hundreds. The reach and success of these rallies was closely monitored. And then there's a section, uh, deleted harm to ongoing matter. And then the next page is, is also entitled harm to ongoing matter. Then at the top of page 31, from June 2016 until the end of the presidential campaign, almost all of the U.S. rallies organized by the IRA focused on the U.S. election often promoting the Trump campaign and opposing the Clinton campaign. Pro-Trump rallies included three in New York, a series of pro-Trump rallies in Florida in August 2016, uh, and a series of pro-Trump rallies in October 2016 in Pennsylvania. The Florida rallies drew the attention of the Trump campaign which posted about the Miami rally on candidate Trump's Facebook account, as discussed below. Many of the same IRA employees who oversaw the IRA's social media accounts also conducted the day-to-day recruiting for political rallies inside the United States. And the next section is deleted, um, uh, harm to ongoing matter. Six. Targeting and recruitment of U.S. persons. As early as 2014, the IRA instructed its employees to target U.S. persons who could be used to advance its operational goals. Initially, recruitment focused on U.S. persons who could amplify the content posted by the IRA. And the next two parts are... uh, deleted, saying, uh, indicating harm to ongoing matter. IRA employees frequently used, and then this section uh, deleted, investigative technique, and then it continues with Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to contact and recruit U.S. persons who followed the group. The IRA recruited U.S. persons from across the political spectrum. For example... The IRA targeted the family of, and then there are a couple of words uh, deleted, indicating personal privacy, and a number of black social justice activists while, while posing as a grassroots, grassroots group called, quote, Black Matters U.S. In February 2017, the persona, quote, Black fist, unquote, purporting to want to teach African Americans to protect themselves when contacted by law enforcement, hired a self-defense instructor in New York to offer classes sponsored by Black Fist. 
the IRA also recruited moderators of, uh, I'm sorry, the IRA also recruited moderators of social, conservative social media groups to promote IRA generated content as well as recruited individuals to perform political acts such as walking around New York City dressed up, dressed up as Santa Claus with a Trump mask. Then the next three sections are harm to ongoing matter and it picks up. As the IRA's online audience became larger, the IRA tracked U.S. persons with whom they communicated and had successfully tasked with tasks ranging from organizing rallies on, uh, to, to talking pictures with, I'm sorry, <laughs> organizing rallies to taking pictures, sorry for that, with certain political messages. And then it, then it continues with harm to ongoing matter. Picking up at the top of page 33, there's a large redacted section. And number seven, interactions and contacts with the Trump campaign. The investigation identified two different forms of connections between the IRA and members of the Trump campaign. The investigation identified no similar connections between the IRA and the Clinton campaign. First, on multiple occasions, members and surrogates of the Trump campaign promoted typically by linking, retweeting, or similar methods of reposting, pro-Trump or anti-Clinton content published by the IRA through IRA-controlled social media accounts. Additionally, in a few instances, IRA employees represented themselves as U.S. persons to communicate with members of the Trump campaign in an effort to seek assistance and coordination on IRA-organized political rallies inside the United States. Section A. Trump campaign promotion of IRA political materials. Among the U.S. leaders of public opinion targeted by the IRA were various members and surrogates of the Trump campaign. In total, Trump campaign affiliates promoted dozens of tweets, posts, and other political content created by the IRA. Posts from the IRA-controlled Twitter account, at 10GOP, were cited or retweeted by multiple Trump campaign officials and surrogates, including Donald J. Trump, Jr., Eric Trump, Kellyanne Conway, Brad Parscall, and Michael T. Flynn. These posts included allegations of voter fraud, as well as allegations that Secretary, Mc Secretary Clinton had mishandled classified information. A November 7, 2016 post from the IRA-controlled Twitter account at Pamela Moore 13 was retweeted by Donald J. Trump, Jr. On September 19, 2017, President Trump's personal account at Real Donald Trump responded to a tweet from the IRA-controlled account at 10GOP, the backup account of uppercase at 10GOP, which had already been deactivated by Twitter. The tweet read, we love you, Mr. President. IRA employees monitored the reaction of the Trump campaign and later Trump administration officials to their tweets. For example, on August 23, 2016, the IRA-controlled persona Matt Skyber Facebook account, sent a message to a U.S. Tea Party activist writing that Mr. Trump posted about our event in Miami. This is great. The IRA employee included a screenshot of candidate Trump's Facebook account, which included a post about the August 20, 2016 political rallies organized by the IRA. Then there's a redacted section. Section B, contact with Trump campaign officials in connection with rallies. Starting in June 2016, the IRA contacted different U.S. persons affiliated with the Trump campaign in an effort to coordinate pro-Trump IRA organized rallies inside the United States. In all cases, the IRA contacted the campaign while claiming to be U.S. political activists working on behalf of a conservative grassroots organization. The IRA's contacts included requests for signs and other materials to use at rallies, as well as requests to promote the rallies and help coordinate logistics. While certain campaign volunteers agreed to provide the requested support, for example, agreeing to set aside a number of signs, the investigation has not identified evidence that any Trump campaign official understood the requests were coming from foreign nationals. In sum, the investigation established that Russia interfered in the 2016 presidential election through the Active Measures social media campaign carried out by the IRA 
an organization funded by Prigozhin and companies that he controlled. As explained further in Volume 1, Section 5A, the office concluded, and a grand jury has alleged, that Prigozhin, his companies, and IRA employees violated U.S. law through these operations, principally by undermining through deceptive acts the work of federal agencies charged with regulating foreign influence in U.S. elections. Section 3, Russian Hacking and Dumping Operations. Beginning in March 2016, units of the Russian Federation's main intelligence directorate of the general staff, the GRU, hacked the computers and email accounts of organizations, employees, and volunteers supporting the Clinton campaign, including the email account of campaign chairman John Podesta. Starting in April 2016, the GRU hacked into the computer networks of the Democratic Congressional Committee and the Democratic National Committee. The GRU targeted hundreds of email accounts used by Clinton campaign employees, advisors, and volunteers. In total, the GRU stole hundreds of thousands of documents from the compromised email accounts and networks. The GRU later released stolen Clinton campaign and DNC documents through online personas, DC Leaks, and Guccifer 2.0, and later through the organization WikiLeaks. The release of the documents was designed in time to interfere with the 2016 U.S. presidential campaign and to undermine the Clinton campaign. The Trump campaign showed interest in the WikiLeaks re releases, and in the summer and fall of 2016, there's a redacted portion. WikiLeaks' first Clinton-related release, redacted. The Trump campaign stayed in contact, redacted, about WikiLeaks activities. The investigation was unable to resolve, redacted. WikiLeaks' release of the stolen Podesta emails on October 7, 2016. The same day a video from years earlier was published of Trump using graphic language about women. Section A, GRU hacking directed at the Clinton campaign. Number one. GRU units target the Clinton campaign. Two military units of the GRU carried out the computer intrusions into the Clinton campaign, DNC and DCCC, military units 26165 and 74455. Military unit 26165 is a GRU cyber unit dedicated to targeting military, political, governmental, and non-governmental organizations outside of Russia including in the United States. The unit was subdivided into departments with different specialties. One department, for example, developed specialized malicious software, or malware, while another department conducted large-scale spear phishing campaigns. There's a redaction. A Bitcoin mining operation to secure Bitcoin, sorry, used to purchase computer infrastructure and used in hacking operations. Military Unit 74455 is a related GRU unit with multiple departments that engaged in cyber operations. Unit 74455 assisted in the release of documents stolen by Unit 26165, the promotion of those releases, and the publication of anti-Clinton content on social media accounts operated by the GRU. Officers from Unit 74455 separately hacked computers belonging to state boards of elections, secretaries of state, and U.S. companies that supplied software and other technology related to the administration of U.S. elections. Beginning in mid-March 2016, Unit 26165 had primary responsibility for hacking the DCCC and DNC, as well as email accounts of individuals affiliated with the Clinton campaign. Unit 26165 used something redacted to learn about something redacted, different Democratic websites, including Democrats.org, HillaryClinton.com, DNC.org, and DCCC.org. Further redaction. Began before the GRU had obtained any credentials or gained access to these networks, indicating that the later DCCC and DNC intrusions were not crimes of opportunity, but rather the result of targeting. GRU officers also sent hundreds of spear phishing emails to the work and personal email accounts of Clinton campaign employees and volunteers. Between May 10, 2016 and March 15, 2016, Unit 26165 appears to have sent approximately 90 spear phishing emails to email accounts at hillaryclinton.com. Starting on March 15, 2016, the GRU began targeting Google email accounts used by Clinton campaign employees, along with a smaller number of dnc.org email accounts. 
The GRU's spear phishing operation enabled it to gain access to numerous email accounts of Clinton campaign employees and volunteers, including campaign chairman John Podesta, junior volunteers assigned to the Clinton campaign's advance team, informal Clinton campaign advisors, and a DNC employee. GRU officers stole tens of thousands of emails from spear phishing victims, including various Clinton campaign related communications. Number two. Intrusions into the DCCC and DNC networks. A, initial access. By no later than April 12, 2016, the GRU had gained access to the DCCC computer network using the credentials stolen from a DCCC employee who had been successfully spearfished the week before. Over the ensuing weeks, the GRU traversed the network, identifying different computers connected to the DCCC network. By stealing network access credentials along the way, including those of IT administrators with unrestricted access to the system, the GRU compromised approximately 29 different computers on the DCCC network. Approximately six days after the first hacking into the DCCC network, on April 18, 2016, GRU officers gained access to the DNC network via a virtual private network connection between the DCCC and DNC networks. Between April 18, 2016 and June 8, 2016, Unit 26165 compromised more than 30 computers on the DNC network, including the DNC mail server and shared file server. Section B, implantation of malware on DCCC and DNC networks. Unit 26165 implanted on the DCCC and DNC networks two types of customized malware, known as X-Agent and X-Tunnel. Mimicats, a credential harvesting tool, and RARE.exe, R -A, -R a tool used in these intrusions to compile and compress materials for exfiltration. XAgent was a multifunction hacking tool that allowed Unit 26165 to log keystrokes, take screenshots, and gather other data about the infected computers, such as file directories and operating systems. XTunnel was a hacking tool that created an encrypted contiction connection between the victim, DCCC DNC computers, and the GRU controlled computers outside the DCCC and DNC networks that was capable of large scale data transfers. GRU officers then used X-Tunnel to exfiltrate stolen data from the victim computers. To operate X-Agent and X-Tunnel on the DCCC and DNC networks, Unit 26165 officers set up a group of computers outside those networks to communicate with the implanted malware. The first set of GRU-controlled computers, known, as, known by the GRU as middle servers, sent and received messages to and from malware on the DNC DCCC networks. The middle servers, in turn, relayed messages to a second set of GRU-controlled computers, labeled internally by the GRU as an AMS panel. The AMS panel, redaction, served as a nerve center through which GRU officers monitored and directed the malware's operations on the DNC DCCC networks. The AMS panel used to control X-Agent during the DCCC and DNC intrusions was housed on a leased computer located near Redaction, Arizona. And there's further redactions. The Arizona-based AMS panel also stored thousands of files containing key logging sessions captured through X agent. These sessions were captured as GRU officers monitored DCCC and DNC employees' work on infected computers regularly between April 2016 and June 2016. Data captured in these key logging sessions included passwords, internal communications between employees, banking information, and sensitive personal information. Section C, theft of documents from DNC and DCCC networks. Officers from Unit 26165 stole thousands of documents from the DCCC and DNC networks, including significant amounts of data pertaining to the 2016 U.S. federal elections. Stolen documents included internal strategy documents, fundraising data, opposition research, and emails from the work inboxes of DNC employees. The GRU began stealing DCCC data shortly after it gained access to the network. On April 14, 2016, Approximately three days after the initial intrusion, GRU officers downloaded RAR.exe onto the DCCC's document server. On the following day, the GRU searched one compromised DCCC computer for files containing, uh, containing search items 
that included Hillary, DNC, Cruz, and Trump. On April 25, 2016, the GRU collected and compressed PDF and Microsoft documents from folders on the DCCC's shared file server that pertain to the 2016 election. The GRE appears to have compressed and exfiltrated over 70 gigabytes of data from this file server. The GRU also stole documents from the DNC network shortly after gaining access. On April 22, 2016, the GRU copied files from the DNC network to GRU-controlled computers. Stolen documents included the DNC's opposition research into candidate Trump. Between approximately May 25, 2016 and June 1, 2016, GRU officers accessed the DNC's mail server from a GRU-controlled computer leased inside the United States. During these connections, Unit 26165 officers appear to have stolen thousands of emails and attachments, which were later released by WikiLeaks in July 2016. Section B, dissemination of the hacked materials. The GRU's operations extended beyond stealing materials and included releasing documents stolen from the Clinton campaign and its supporters. The GRU carried out the anonymous reliefs through two fictitious online personas that it created, DC Leaks and Guccifer 2.0, and later through the organization WikiLeaks. Number one, DC Leaks. The GRU began planning the releases at least as early as April 19, 2016, when Unit 26165 registered the domain dcleaks.com through a service that anonymized, anonymized the registrant. Unit 26165 paid for the registration using a pool of Bitcoin that it had mined. The dcleaks.com landing page pointed to different tranches of stolen documents arranged by victim or subject matter. Other dcleaks.com pages contained indices of the stolen materials that were being released, bearing the sender, recipient, and date of the email. To control access and timing of releases, pages were sometimes password protected for a period of time and later made unrestricted to the public. Starting in June 2016, the GRU posted stolen documents onto the website dcleaks.com, including documents stolen from a number of individuals associated with the Clinton campaign. These documents appear to have originated from personal email accounts, in particular Google and Microsoft accounts, rather than the DNC and DCCC computer networks. DC Leaks victims included an advisor to the Clinton campaign, a former DNC employee, and Clinton campaign uh, employee, and four other campaign volunteers. The GRU released through dcleaks.com thousands of documents, including personal identifying and financial information, internal correspondence related to the Clinton campaign and prior political jobs, and fundraising files and information. GRU officers operated a Facebook page under the DC Leaks moniker, which they primarily used to promote releases of materials. The Facebook page was administered through a small number of pre-existing GRU-controlled Facebook accounts. GRU officers also used the DC Leaks Facebook account, the Twitter account at DC Leaks, and the email account dcleaksproject at gmail.com to communicate privately with reporters and other U.S. persons. GRU officers using the DC Leaks persona gave certain reporters early access to our archives of leaked files by sending them links and passwords to pages on the DC Leaks website that had not yet become public. For example, on June 14, 2016, GRU officers operating under the DC Leaks persona sent a link and password for a non-public DC Leaks web page to a U.S. reporter via the Facebook account. Similarly, on September 14, 2016, GRU officers sent reporters Twitter direct messages from at DC Leaks with a password to another non-public part of the dcleaks.com website. The dcleaks.com website remained operational and public until March 2017. Number two, Guccifer 2.0. On June 14, 2016, the DNC and its cyber response team announced the breach of the DNC network and the suspected theft of DNC documents. In the statements, the cyber response team alleged that the Russian state-sponsored actors, which they referred to as Fancy Bear, were responsible for the breach. Apparently, in response to that announcement on June 15, 2016, GRU officers using the persona Guccifer 2.0 created a WordPress blog. In the hours leading up to the launch of the WordPress blog, GRU officers logged into a Moscow-based server 
used and managed by Unit 74455, and search for a number of specific words and phrases in English, including some hundred sheets, Illuminati, and worldwide known. Approximately two hours after the last of those searches, Lucifer 2.0 published its first post, attributing the DNC server hack to a lone Romanian hacker and using several of the unique English words and phrases that the GRU officers had searched for that day. That same day, June 15, 2016, the GRU also used the Guccifer 2.0 WordPress blog to begin releasing to the public documents stolen from the DNC and DCCC computer networks. The Guccifer 2.0 persona ultimately released thousands of documents stolen from the DNC and DCCC in a series of blog posts between June 15, 2016 and October 18, 2016. Released documents included opposition research performed by the DNC, including a memorandum analyzing potential criticisms of candidate Trump, internal policy documents such as recommendations on how to address politically sensitive issues, analyses of specific congressional races and fundraising documents. Releases were organized around thematic issues such as specific states, e.g. Florida and Pennsylvania, that were perceived as competitive in the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Beginning in late June 2016, the GRU also used the Guccifer 2.0 persona to release documents directly to reporters and other interested individuals. Specifically, on June 27, 2016, Guccifer 2.0 sent an email to the news outlet The Smoking Gun, offering to provide exclusive access to some leaked emails linked to Hillary Clinton's staff. The GRU later sent the reporter a password and link to a locked portion of the DCLeaks.com website that contained an archive of emails stolen by Unit 26165 from a Clinton campaign volunteer in March 2016. That the Guccifer 2.0 persona provided reporters access to a restricted portion of the DCLeaks website tends to indicate that both personas were operated by the same or a closely related group of people. The GRU continued its release efforts through Guccifer 2.0 into August 2016. For example, on August 15, 2016, the Guccifer 2.0 persona sent a candidate for the U.S. Congress documents related to the candidate's opponent. On August 22, 2016, the Guccifer 2.0 persona transferred approximately 2.5 gigabytes of Florida-related data stolen from the DCCC to a U.S. blogger covering Florida politics. On October 22, 2016, the Guccifer 2.0 persona sent a U.S. reporter document stolen from the DCCC pertaining to the Black Lives Matter mo movement. The GRU was also in contact through the Guccifer 2.0 persona with Redacted, a former Trump campaign member. Further redactions. In early August 2016, Redacted, Twitter's suspension of the Guccifer 2.0 Twitter account. After it was reinstated, GRU officers posing as Guccifer 2.0 wrote, redacted, via private message, thank you for writing back. Do you find anything interesting in the docs I posted? On August 17, 2016, the GRU added, please tell me if I can help you anyhow. It would be a great pleasure to me. On September 9, 2016, the GRU, again posting as Guccifer 2.0, referred to a stolen DCCC document posted on online and asked, redacted, what do you think of the info on the turnout model for the Democrats' entire presidential campaign? Redacted responded, pretty standard. The investigation did not identify evidence of other communications between Redacted and Guccifer 2.0. Number three, the use of WikiLeaks. In order to expand its interference in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, the GRU units transferred many of the documents they stole from the DNC and the chairman of the Clinton campaign to WikiLeaks. GRU officers used both the DC Leaks and Guccifer 2.0 personas to communicate with WikiLeaks through Twitter private messaging and through encrypted channels, including, possibly, through WikiLeaks' private communication system. Section A, WikiLeaks expressed opposition toward the Clinton campaign. WikiLeaks, and particularly its founder, Julian Assange, privately expressed opposition to candidate Clinton well before the first release of stolen documents. In November 2015, Assange wrote to other members and associates of WikiLeaks that, we believe it would be much better for GOP to win. Dems plus media plus liberals would then form a block to rein in their worst qualities. With Hillary in charge, GOP will be pushing for her worst qualities. Dems plus media plus neoliberals will be mute. 
She's a bright, well-connected, sadistic sociopath. In March 2016, WikiLeaks released a searchable archive of approximately 30,000 Clinton emails that had been obtained through Freedom of Information Act litigation. While designing the archive, one WikiLeaks member explained the reason for building the archive to another associate. We want this repository to become the place to search for background on Hillary's plotting at the State Department during 2009 to 2013. Firstly, because it's useful and will annoy Hillary, but second, because we want to be seen to be a resource or player in the U.S. election, because it may encourage people to send us even more important links. Section B, WikiLeaks first contact with Lucifer 2.0 and DC Leaks. Shortly after the GRU's first release of stolen documents through DCLeaks.com in June 2016, GRU officers also used the DC Leaks persona to contact WikiLeaks about possible coordination in the future release of stolen emails. On June 14, 2016, at DC Leaks sent a direct message to WikiLeaks, noting, you announced your organization was preparing to publish more Hillary's emails. We're ready to support you. We have some sensitive information too, in particular, her financial documents. Let's do it together. What do you think about publishing our info at the same moment? Thank you. And then there's some redaction. Around the same time, WikiLeaks initiated communications with the GRU persona Guccifer 2.0 shortly after it was used to release documents stolen from the DNC. On June 22, 2016, seven days after Guccifer 2.0's first release of stolen DNC documents, WikiLeaks used Twitter's direct message function to con contact the Guccifer 2.0 Twitter account and suggest that Guccifer 2.0 send any new material stolen from the DNC here for us to review and it will have a much higher impact than what you're doing. On July 6, 2016, WikiLeaks again contacted Guccifer 2.0 through Twitter's private messaging function, writing, if you have anything Hillary related, we want it in the next two days, preferable, because the DNC is approaching and she will solidify Bernie supporters behind her after. The Guccifer 2.0 persona responded, okay, I see. WikiLeaks also explained, we think Trump has only a 25% chance of winning against Hillary, so conflict between Bernie and Hillary is interesting. Section C, the GRU's transfer of stolen materials to WikiLeaks. Both the GRU and WikiLeaks sought to hide their communications, which has limited the office's ability to collect all of the communications between them. Thus, although it is clear that the stolen DNC and Podesta documents were transferred from the GRU to WikiLeaks, and then there's a redacted portion. The office was able to identify when the GRU, operating through its personas Guccifer 2.0 and DC Leaks, transferred some of the stolen documents to WikiLeaks through online archives set up by the GRU. Assange had access to the internet from the Ecuadorian embassy in London, England. And then there's the redacted portion. On July 14, 2016, GRU officers used a Guccifer 2.0 email account to send WikiLeaks an email bearing the subject Big Archive and the message a new attempt. The email contained an encrypted attachment with the name WCDNC Link 1 TXT GPG. Using the Guccifer 2.0 account, GRU officers sent WikiLeaks an encrypted file and instructions on how to open it. On July 18, 2016, WikiLeaks confirmed in a direct message to the Guccifer 2.0 account that it had the one gigabyte or so archive and would make a release of stolen documents this week. On July 22, 2016, WikiLeaks re released over 20,000 emails and other documents stolen from the DNC computer networks. The D Democratic National Convention began three days later. Similar communications occurred between WikiLeaks and the GRU-operated persona, DC Leaks. On September 15, 2016, DC Leaks wrote to at WikiLeaks, Hi there, I'm from DC Leaks. How could we discuss some submission-related issues? I'm trying to reach out to you via your secured chat, but getting no response. I've got something that might interest you. You won't be disappointed, I promise. The WikiLeaks account responded, hi there, without further elaboration. The DC Leaks account did not respond immediately. The same day, the Twitter account at Guccifer2 sent at DC Leaks a direct message, which is the first known contact between the personas. During subsequent communications, the Guccifer 2.0 persona informed DC Leaks that WikiLeaks was trying to contact DC Leaks and arrange for a way to speak through encrypted emails. 
An analysis of the metadata collected from the WikiLeaks site revealed that the stolen Podesta emails show a creation date of September 19, 2016. Based on information about Assange's computer and its possible operating system, this date may be when the GRU staged the stolen Podesta emails for transfer to WikiLeaks, as the GRU had previously done in July 2016 for the DNC emails. The WikiLeaks site also released PDFs and other documents taken from Podesta that were attachments to emails in his account. These documents had a creation date of October 2, 2016, which appears to be the date the attachments were separately staged by WikiLeaks on its site. Beginning on September 20, 2016, WikiLeaks and DCLeaks resumed communications in a brief exchange. On September 22, 2016, a DCLeaks email account, dcleaksproject at gmail.com, sent an email to a WikiLeaks account with the subject's submission and the message, hi from DCLeaks. The email contained a PGP encrypted message with the file name Wikimail text GPG. Then there's a redaction. The email, however, bears a number of similarities to the July 14, 2016 email in which GRU officers used the Guccifer 2.0 persona to give WikiLeaks access to the archive of DNC files. On September 22, 2016, the same day of DCLeaks' email to WikiLeaks, the Twitter account at DCLeaks sent a single message to at WikiLeaks with the string of characters, and then there's a redaction. The office cannot rule out that stolen documents were transferred to WikiLeaks through intermediaries who visited during the summer of 2016. For example, public reporting identified Andrew muller as a WikiLeaks associate who may have assisted with the transfer of those stolen documents to WikiLeaks. And then there's further redaction. On October 7, 2016, WikiLeaks released the first email stolen from the Podesta email account. In total, WikiLeaks released 33 tranches of stolen emails between October 7, 2016 and November 7, 2016. The releases included private speeches given by Clinton, internal communications between Podesta and other high-ranking members of the Clinton campaign, and correspondence related to the Clinton Foundation. In total, WikiLeaks released over 50,000 documents stolen from P Podesta's personal email account. The last in-time email released from Podesta's account was dated March 21, 2016, two days after Podesta received a spear phishing email sent by the GRU. Section D. WikiLeaks statements dissembling about the source of stolen materials. As reports attributing the DNC and DCCC hacks to the Russian government emerged, WikiLeaks and Assange made several public statements apparently designed to obscure the source of the materials that WikiLeaks was releasing. The file transfer evidence described above and other information uncovered during the investigation discredit WikiLeaks claims about the source of the material it posted. Beginning in the summer of 2016, Assange and WikiLeaks made a number of statements about Seth Rich, a former DNC staff member who was killed in July 2016. The statements about Rich implied falsely that he had been the source of the stolen DNC emails. On August 9, 2016, the at WikiLeaks Twitter account posted, announce, WikiLeaks has decided to issue a 20,000 US dollar reward for information leading to the conviction for the murder of DNC staffer Seth Rich. Likewise, on October 25th, 2016, Assange was asked in an interview, why are you so interested in Seth Rich's killer? And responded, we're very interested in anything that might be a threat to alleged WikiLeaks sources. The interview re interviewer responded to Assange's statement by commenting, I know you don't want to relieve, reveal your source, but it certainly sounds like you're suggesting a man who leaked information to WikiLeaks was then murdered. Assange replied, if there's someone who's potentially connected to our publication, and that person has been murdered in suspicious circumstances, it doesn't necessarily mean that the two are connected, but it is a very serious matter. That type of allegation is very serious, as it's taken very seriously by us. After the US intelligence community publicly announced its assessment that Russia was behind the hacking operation, Assange continued to deny that the Clinton materials released by WikiLeaks had come from Russian hacking. According to media reports, Assange told a U.S. congressman that the DNC hack was an inside job and purported to have physical proof that Russians did not give the materials to Assange. Section C, additional GRU cyber operations. While releasing the stolen emails and documents through DC leaks, Guccifer 2.0 and WikiLeaks, GRU officers continued to target and hack victims, 
linked to the Democratic campaign, and eventually to target entities responsible for election administration in several states. Number one, summer and fall 2016 operations targeting Democratic-linked victims. On July 27, 2016, Unit 26165 targeted email accounts connected to candidate Clinton's personal office, or redaction. Earlier that day, candidate Trump made public statements that included the following. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. The 30,000 emails were apparently a reference to emails described in media accounts as having been stored on a personal server that candidate Clinton had used while serving as Secretary of State. Within approximately five hours of Trump's statement, GRU officers targeted, for the first time, Clinton's personal office. After candidate Trump's remarks, Unit 26165 created and sent malicious links targeting 15 email accounts at the domain redacted, including an email account belonging to Clinton aid redacted. The investigation did not find evidence of earlier GRU attempts to compromise accounts hosted on this domain. It is unclear how the GRU was able to identify these email accounts, which were not public. Unit 26165 officers also hacked into a DNC account hosted on a cloud computing service redacted. On September 20th, 2016, the GRU began to generate copies of the DNC data using a redacted function designed to allow users to produce backups of databases referred to redacted as snapshots. The GRU then stole those snapshots by moving them to redacted account that they controlled. From there, the copies were moved to GRU-controlled computers. The GRU stole approximately 300 gigabytes of data from the DNC cloud-based account. Victims included U.S. state and local entities, such as state boards of elections, SBOEs, secretaries of state, uh, and county governments, as well as individuals who worked for those entities. The GRU also targeted private technology firms responsible for manufacturing and administering election-related software and hardware, such as voter registration software, and electronic polling stations. The GRU continued to target these victims through the elections in November 2016, while the investigation identified evidence that the GRU targeted these individuals and entities. The office did not investigate further. The office did not, for instance, obtain or examine servers or other relevant items belonging to these victims. The office understands that the FBI the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the states have separately investigated the activity. By at least the summer of 2016, GRU officers sought access to state and local networks by exploiting known software vulnerability on websites of state and local entities. GRU officers, for example, targeted state and local databases of registered voters using a technique known as SOL injection, by which malicious code was sent to the state or local website in order to run commands, such as exfiltrating the database contents. The, in one instance, in approximately June of 2016, the GRU compromised the computer network of the Illinois State Board of Elections by exploiting a vulnerability in the SBOE's website. The GRU then gained access to a database containing information on millions of registered Illinois voters 
and extracted data related to thousands of U.S. voters before the malicious activity was identified. GRU officers investigative technique scan state and local websites for vulnerabilities. For example, over a two-day period in July 2016, GRU redacted investigative technique for vulnerabilities on websites of more than two dozen states investigative techniques. Uh, it proceeds uh, during the um, footnotes of investigative technique, investigative technique, investigative technique. Similar redacted for vulnerabilities continued through the election. Unit 74455 also sent spear splishing emails to public officials involved in election administration and personnel at companies involved in voting technology. In August 2016, GRU officers targeted employees of Redacted, a voting technology company that developed software used by numerous U.S. counties to manage voter rolls and install malware on the company network. Similarly, in November 2016, the GRU sent spear splishing emails to over 120 email accounts used by Florida County officials responsible for administering the 2016 U.S. elections. The spear splishing emails contain an attached Word document coded with malicious software, commonly known or referred to as a Trojan, that permitted the GRU to access the infected com um, computer. The FBI was separately responsible for this investigation. We understand the FBI believes that this operation enabled the GRU to gain access to the network of at least one Florida County government. The office did not independently verify that belief and, as explained above, did not undertake the investigative steps that would have been necessary to do so. D, Trump campaign and the dissemination of hacked materials. The Trump campaign showed interest in WikiLeaks releases of, backed, of hacked materials throughout the summer and fall of 2016. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Redacted, H-O-M, harm to ongoing matter. Background, uh, one and then A, background, and then redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Continuous redacted investigative matter. B, contacts with the campaign about WikiLeaks. Redacted, harm to ongoing matters. On June 12, 2016, Assange claimed in a televised interview to have emails related to Hillary Clinton, which are pending publication, but provided no additional context. In debriefing with the office, former Deputy Campaign Chairman Rick Gates said that redacted harm to ongoing matters. Gates recalled candidate Trump being generally frustrated that the Clinton emails had not been found. Paul Manafort, who would later become Campaign Chairman, redacted harm to ongoing matter, redacted. Michael Cohen, former executive vice president of the Trump Organization and special counsel to Donald J. Trump, told the office that he recalled an incident in which he was in candidate Trump's office in the Trump Tower, redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Cohen further told the office that after WikiLeaks' subsequent release of stolen DNC emails in July 20, 2016, candidate Trump said to Cohen something to the effect of, Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Harm to ongoing matter, redacted. According to Gates, Manafort expressed excitement about the relief. Redacted, harm to ongoing matters. Manafort, for his part, told the office that shortly after WikiLeaks' July 22nd release, Manafort also spoke with candidate Trump. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Manafort also redacted, harm to ongoing matter, wanted to keep apprised of any continuously redacted harm to ongoing matter throughout the footnote developments with WikiLeaks and separately told Gates to keep in touch redacted harm to ongoing matters about future WikiLeaks releases. According to Gates, by the late summer of 2016, 
the Trump campaign was planning a press strategy, a communications campaign, and messaging based on the possible release of Clinton emails to WikiLeaks redacted harm to ongoing matters, while Trump and Gates were driving to LaGuardia Airport redacted harm to ongoing matters. Shortly after the call, candidate Trump told Gates that more releases of damaging information would be coming. Redacted harm to ongoing matter. Redacted harm to ongoing matter. Redacted harm to ongoing matter. Corsi is an author who holds a doctorate in political science. In 2016, Corsi also worked for the media outlet World Net Daily. Redacted harm to ongoing matter. Continue to redact uh, throughout the footnotes. Harm to ongoing matter. Corsi told the office during the interviews that he must have previously discussed Assange with Malik. Previously was redacted, now it's redacted again, harm to ongoing matter. Grand jury, harm uh, redacted. According to Malik, Corsi asked him to put Corsi in touch with Assange, whom Corsi wishes to interview. Malik recalled that Corsi also suggested that individuals in the orbit of UK politician Nigel Farage might be able to contact Assange and ask him if Malik knew them. Malik told Corsi that he would think about the request but made no actual attempt to connect Corsi with Assange. Redacted, harm to ongoing matters, redacted in footnotes. Malik stated to investigators that beginning in or about August 2016, he and Corsi had multiple FaceTime discussions about WikiLeaks redacted, harm to ongoing matter, had made a connection to Assange and that the hacked emails of John Podesta would be released prior to election day and would be helpful to the Trump campaign. In one conversation in our, around August or September of 2016, Corsi told Malik that the release of the Podesta emails was coming, after which we were going to be in the driver's seat. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Redacted, on, harm to ongoing matter. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Redacted, 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 redacted. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Redacted, 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 harm to ongoing matter. On October 7, 2016, four days after the Assange press conference, redacted, harm to ongoing matter, the Washington Post published an Access Hollywood video that captured con comments by candidate Trump some years earlier that were expected to adversely affect the campaign. Less than an hour after the video's publication, WikiLeaks released the first set of emails stolen by the GRU from the account of Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Corsi said that because he had no direct means of communicating with WikiLeaks, he told members of the news site WND who were participating on a conference call with him that day to reach Assange immediately. Corsi claimed that the pressure was enormous. Redacted, ongoing matter. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. And recalled telling the conference call the Access Hollywood tape was coming. Corsi said that he was convinced that his efforts had caused WikiLeaks to release the emails when they did. In a later November 2018 interview, Corsi said that he thought that he had told people on a WND conference call about the forthcoming tape and had sent out a tweet asking whether anyone would contact Assange, but then said that maybe he had done nothing. The office investigated Corsi's allegations about the events of October 7, 2016, but found little corroboration for his allegation about that day. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. Redacted, harm to ongoing matter. However, the phone records themselves do not indicate that the conversation was with any of the reporters who broke the Access Hollywood story, and the office has not otherwise been able to identify the substance of the conversation, redacted, harm to ongoing matter. However, the office has not identified any conference call participant or anyone who spoke to Corsi that day 
who says that they received non-public information about the tape from Corsi or acknowledged having contacted a member of WikiLeaks on October 7, 2016, after a conversation with Corsi. Donald Trump Jr. interaction with WikiLeaks. Donald Trump Jr. had direct electronic communication with WikiLeaks during the campaign period. On September 20, 2016, an individual Jason named Jason Fishbein sent WikiLeaks the password of an unlaunched website found on Trump's unprecedented and dangerous ties. Donald Trump had a direct electronic communications. And in dealing with that, we move to uh, the ties that Donald Trump Jr. had with Russia. PutinTrump.org, WikiLeaks, publicly tweeted, let's bomb Iraq, progress for America PAC to launch PutinTrump.org at 9.30 a.m. Oops, PW is Putin Trump, PutinTrump.org. Several hours later, WikiLeaks sent a Twitter direct message to Donald Trump Jr., a PAC-run anti-Trump site, PutinTrump.org, is about to launch. The PAC is recycled, is a recycled pro-Iraq war PAC. We have guessed the password. It is Putin Trump. See about for those for who is behind it and comments. Any comments? Several hours later, Trump Jr. emailed a variety of senior campaign staff. Guys, I got a weird Twitter DM from WikiLeaks. See below. I tried the password and it works. And the about section they reference contains the next PIC in terms of who is behind them. And it is a DM. Do you know the people mentioned what the conspiracy they are looking for could be? These are just screenshots, but it's a fully built out page claiming to be a pack. Let me know your thoughts and if we want to look into it. Trump Jr. attached a screenshot of the about page for the unlaunched site PutinTrump.org. The next day after the website had launched publicly, Trump Jr. sent a direct message to WikiLeaks off the record. I don't know who that is, but I'll ask around. Thanks. On October 3rd, 2016, WikiLeaks sent another direct message to Trump Jr. asking you guys to help disseminate a link alleging candidate Clinton had advocated using a drone to target Julian Assange. Trump Jr. responded that he already had done so and asked, what's behind this Wednesday leak I keep reading about? WikiLeaks did not respond. On October 12, 2016, WikiLeaks wrote again that it was great to see you and your dad talking about our publications. Strongly suggest your dad tweets this link if he mentions us, W-L-S-E-A-R-C-H dot T-K, WikiLeaks wrote that the link would help Trump in digging through leaked emails and stated, we just released Podesta's emails, part four. Two days later, Trump Jr. publicly tweeted the W-L search dot T-K link. Some more redacted. Other potential campaign interests in Russian hacked materials. Throughout 2016, the Trump campaign expressed interest in Hillary Clinton's private email server and whether approximately 30,000 emails from that server had in fact been permanently destroyed as reported by the media. Several individuals associated with the campaign were contacted in 2016 about various efforts to obtain the missing Clinton emails and other stolen material in support of the Trump campaign. Some of these contacts were met with skepticism and nothing came of them. Others were pursued to some degree. The investigation did not find evidence that the Trump campaign recovered any such Clinton emails or that these contacts were part of a coordinated effort between Russia and the Trump campaign. Henry Osnowski, a.k.a. Henry Greenberg, 
In the spring of 2016, Trump campaign advisor Michael Caputo learned through a Florida-based Russian business partner that another Florida-based Russian, Henry Oskinowski, who also went by Henry Greenberg, claimed to have information pertaining to Hillary Clinton. Caputo notified Roger Stone and brokered communication between Stone and Oskinowski. Oskinowski and Stone were set up for a May 2016 in-person meeting. Oskinowski was accompanied to the meeting by Alexei Rosin, a Ukrainian associate involved in Florida real estate. At the meeting, Rasin offered to sell Stone derogatory information on Clinton that Rasin claimed to have obtained while working for Clinton. Rasin claimed to possess financial statements demonstrating Clinton's involvement in money laundering with Rasin's companies. According to Eskonowski, Stone asked if the amounts in question totaled millions of dollars but was told it was closer to hundreds of thousands. Stone refused the offer, stating that Trump would not pay attention for, would not pay for opposition research. Onskanyowski claimed to the office that Rafson's motivation was financial. According to Onskanyowski, Rafson had tried unsuccessfully to shop the Clinton information around to other interested parties, and Onskanyowski would receive a cut if the information was sold. Rafson noted in public source documents as the director and or registered agent for a number of Florida companies, none of which appears to be connected to Clinton. The office found no other evidence that Rafson worked for Clinton or any Clinton-related entities. In their statements to investigators, Onjanowski and Caputo had contradictory recollections about the meeting. Onjanowski claimed that Caputo accompanied Stone to the meeting and provided an introduction, whereas Caputo did not tell us that he had attended and claimed that he was never told what information Osinowski offered. Caputo also stated that he was unaware Osinowski sought to be paid for the information until Stone informed him after the fact. The office did not locate Rasson in the United States, uh, although the office confirmed Rasson had been issued a Florida driver's license. The office otherwise was unable to determine the content and origin of the information he purported to offer to Stone. Finally, the investigation did not identify evidence of a connection between the outreach or the meeting and Russian interference efforts, campaign efforts to obtain deleted Clinton emails. After candidate Trump stated on July 27, 2016, that he hoped Russia would find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Trump asked individuals affiliated with his campaign to find the deleted Clinton emails. Michael Flynn, who would later serve as a national security advisor in the Trump administration, recalled that Trump made this request repeatedly and Flynn subsequently contacted multiple people in an effort to obtain the emails. Barbara Ledeen and Peter Smith were among the people contacted by Flynn. Ledeen, a longtime Senate staffer who had previously sought the Clinton emails, provided updates to Flynn about her efforts throughout the summer of 2016. Smith, an investment advisor who was active in Republican politics, also attempted to locate and obtain the deleted Clinton emails. Ledeen began her efforts to obtain the Clinton emails before Flynn's request as early as December 2015. On December 3rd, 2015, she emailed Smith a proposal to obtain the emails, stating, here is a proposal I briefly mentioned to you. The person I described to you would be happy to talk with either, with you either in person or over the phone. The person can get the emails which I view as one, classified, and two, were purloined by our enemies. That would demonstrate what needs to be demonstrated. Attached to the email was a 25-page proposal stating that the Clinton email was in all likelihood breached long ago and that the Chinese, Russian, and Iranian intelligence services could reassemble the server's email 
uh, content, the proposal called for a three-phase approach. The first two phases consisted of open source analysis. The third phase consisted of checking with certain intelligence resources that have or sources that have access through liaison work with various foreign services to determine if any of those services had gotten to the server. The proposal noted, even if a single email was removed and the providence of that email was a foreign service, it would be catastrophic to the Clinton campaign. Smith forwarded the email to two colleagues and wrote, we can discuss to whom it should be referred. On December 16th, 2015, Smith informed Ladine that he declined to participate in her initiative. According to one of Smith's business associates, Smith believed Ladine's initiative was not viable at that time. To find the Clinton emails, however, Smith tried to locate and obtain the emails himself. He created a company, raised tens of thousands of dollars, and recruited security experts and business associates. Smith made claims to others involved in the effort and those from whom he sought funding that he was in contact with hackers with ties and affiliations to Russia who had access to the emails and that his efforts were coordinated with the Trump campaign. On August 28, 2016, Smith sent an email from an encrypted account with the subject, quote, Sec Secretary Clinton's unsecured private email server, end quote, to an undisclosed list of recipients, including campaign co-chairman Sam Clovis. The email stated that Smith was, quote, just fishing two days of sensitive meetings here in D.C. with involved groups to poke and probe on the above. It is clear that the Clinton's home-based unprotected server was hacked with ease by both state-related players and private mercenaries. Parties with very interests are circling to release ahead of the election, end quote. On September 2nd, 2016, Smith directed a business associate to establish KLS LLC to, in furtherance of his search for the deleted Clinton emails. One of the purposes of the KLS research was to manage the funds Smith raised to support of his initiative. KLS research received over $30,000 during the presidential campaign, although Smith represented that he raised even more money. Smith recruited multiple people for his initiative, including security experts to search for, for and authenticate the emails. In early September 2016, as part of his recruitment and fundraising effort, Smith circulated a document stating that his initiative was in coordination with the Trump campaign. Quote, to the extent permitted as an independent expenditure organization, end quote. The document listed multiple individuals, individuals affiliated with the Trump campaign, including Flinch, Clovis, Brannon, and Kellyanne Conway. The investigation established that Smith communicated with at least Flynn and Clovis after his search for the deleted Clinton emails, but the office did not identify evidence that any of the listed individuals initiated or directed Smith's efforts. In September 2016, Smith and Leiden got back in touch with each other about their respective efforts. Leiden wrote to Smith, quote, Wondering if you had some more detailed reports or memos other than data you could have shared because we have come a long way in our efforts since we last visited. visited. We would need as much technical discussion as possible so that we can marry it against the new data we have found and then could share it back to you, your eyes only, end quote. Leadham claimed to have obtained a trove of emails from what she described as the dark web that purported to be the deleted Clinton emails. Lytton wanted to authenticate the emails and solicited contributions to find that effort. Eric Prince provided funding to hire a web advisor, a tech advisor, 
to ascertain the authenticity of the emails. According to Prince, the tech advisor determined the emails were not authentic. A backup of Smith's computer contained two files that had been downloaded from WikiLeaks and that were originally attached to emails received by John Podesta. The files on Smith's computer had, had creation dates of October 2, 2016, which was prior to the date of their release by WikiLeaks. Forensic examination, however, established that the creation date did not reflect when the files were downloaded to Smith's computer. It appears to be creation, appears the creation date was when WikiLeaks staged the documents for release, as discussed in Volume 1, Section 3B, 3, little c, SOPRA. The investigation did not otherwise identify evidence that Smith obtained the files before their release by WikiLeaks. Smith continued to send emails to an undisclosed recipient list about Clinton's deleted emails and until shortly before the election. For example, on October 28, 2016, Smith wrote that there was a tug of war going on within WikiLeaks over its planned releases in the next few days, and that WikiLeaks, quote, has maintained it will save its best revelations for last under the theory this allows little time for response prior to the U.S. election, November 8. An attachment to the email claimed that WikiLeaks would release all, quote, 33,000 deleted emails by November 1st. No emails obtained from Clinton's server were subsequently released. Smith drafted multiple emails stating or intimidating that he was in contact with Russian hackers. For example, in one such email, Smith claimed that in, on August 2016, KLS Research organized meetings with parties who had access to the deleted Clinton emails, including parties with ties and affiliations to Russia. The investigation did not identify evidence that any such meetings occurred. Associates and security experts who worked with Smith on the initiative did not believe that Smith was in contact with Russian hackers and were aware of no such connections. The investigation did not establish that Smith was in contact with Russian hackers or that Smith, leading or any other individuals in touch with the Trump campaign ultimately obtained the deleted emails. In sum, the investigation established that the GRU hacked into email accounts of persons affiliated with the Clinton campaign, as well as the computers of the DNC and the DCCC. The GRU then ex exfiltrated data related to the 26th election from these accounts and computers and disseminated that data through fictitious online persons, DC leaks in Guccifer 2.0 and later through WikiLeaks. The investigation also established that the Trump campaign displayed interest in the WikiLeaks releases and that redacted, redacted, as explained in Volume 1, Section VB, the evidence was sufficient to support computer intrusion and other charges against GRU officials, officers for their role in the election-related hacking. Redacted, redacted. Russian, number four, Russian government links to and contacts with the Trump campaign. The office identified multiple contacts, leaks, leaks in the words of the appointment order between Trump campaign officials and individuals with ties to Russian government. The office investigated whether those contacts constituted a third avenue of attempted Russian interference with or influence on the 2016 presidential election. In particular, the investigation examined whether these contexts involved or resulted in coordination or conspiracy with the Trump campaign and Russia, including with respect to Russia providing assistance to the campaign in exchange for any sort of favorable treatment in the future. Based on the available information, the investigation did not establish such coordination. This section describes the principal links between the Trump campaign and individuals with ties to Russian government, including some contacts with campaign officials or associates that have been publicly reported to involve Russian contacts. Each subsection begins with an overview of the Russian contact at issue and then describes in detail the relevant facts. 
which are generally presented in chronological order, beginning with the early months of the campaign and extending through the post-election transition period. A, campaign period September 2015 through November 8, 2016. Russian government-connected individuals and media entities began showing interest in Trump's campaign in the months after he announced his candidacy in June 2015. Because Trump's status as a public figure at the time was attributable in large part to his prior business and entertainment dealings, this office investigated whether a business contact with Russian-linked individuals and entities during the campaign period, the Trump Tower Moscow Project, see Volume 1, Section 5A1, led to or involved coordination of election assistance. Outreach from individuals with ties to Russia continued in the spring and summer of 2016 when Trump was moving toward and eventually becoming the Republican nominee for president. As set forth below, the office also evaluated a series of links to spirit outreach to two of Trump's then recently named foreign policy advisors, including a representation that Russia had, quote, dirt on Clinton in the form of thousands of emails, dealings with a D.C.-based think tank not specializing in, that specializes in Russia and Russia and has connections with government, governments, um, parentheses, volume one, section 4A4, a meeting at a Trump Tower between the campaign and a Russian lawyer promising dirt on candidate Clinton that was, quote, part of Russia and its government support for Trump, end quote. See volume one, section 4A5. Events at the Republican National Convention, parenthesis, volume one, section 4A6. Post-convention contacts between Trump campaign officials and Russian ambassador to the United States, parenthesis, volume one, section 4A7. And contacts through campaign chairman Paul Manafort, who had previously worked for a, a Russian oligarch in a pro-Russian political party in Ukraine, parenthesis, volume one, section 4AB. Trump, the Trump Tower Mo Moscow Project. The Trump Organization had pursued and completed projects outside the United States as part of its real estate portfolio. Some projects had involved the acquisition and ownership, parenthesis, through subsidiary corporate structures of property. In other cases, the Trump Organization has executed licensing deals with real estate developers and management companies often local to the country where the project was located. Between at least 2013 and 2016, the Trump Organization ex explored a similar licensing deal in Russia involving the construction of a Trump-branded property in Moscow. The project, commonly referred to as a Trump Tower Moscow or Trump Moscow project, anticipated a combination of commercial, hotel, and residential projects, properties, all within the same building. Between 2013 and June 2016, several employees of the Trump Organization, including then President of the Organization, Donald J. Trump, pursued a Moscow deal with several Russian counterparties. From the fall of 2015 until the middle of 2016, Michael Cohen spearheaded the Trump Organization's pursuit of a Trump Tower Moscow project, including by reporting on the project status to candidate Trump and other executives in the Trump Organization. A, Trump Tower Moscow venture with the Krukas Group, uh, 2013 to 2014. The Trump Organization and the Krukas Group, a Russian real estate conglomerate owned and controlled by Aris Agalarov, began discussing a Russian-based real estate project shortly after the conclusion of the 2013 Miss Universe pageant in Moscow. Donald J. Trump Jr. served as the primary negotiator on behalf of the Trump Organization. Emin Agalarv, son of Aris Agalarv, and Ikli Ike Kevin Lancy re represented the Krokus Group during negotiations with the occasional assistance of Robert Goldstone. In December 2013, Gavalazzi and Trump Jr. negotiated and signed preliminary terms 
of an agreement for the Trump Tower Moscow project. On December 23rd, 2013, after discussions with Donald J. Trump, the Trump Organization agreed to accept an arrangement whereby the organization received a flat 3.5 commission on all sales with no licensing fees or incentives. The parties negotiated a letter of intent during January and February of 2014. From 2014 through November 2014, the Trump Organization and Crocus Group discussed development plans for the Moscow project. Sometime before January 24, 2014, the Crocus Group sent the Trump Organization a proposal for a 800-unit, 194-meter building to be constructed at, a, at an Aguilar, Aguilarov-owned site in Moscow called Crocus City, which had also been the site of the Miss Universe pageant. In February 2014, Ivanka Trump met with Emin Aguilarov and toured the Crocus City site during a visit to Moscow. From 2014 through 2014, the groups disguised, discussed design standards and other architectural elements. For example, in July 2014, members of the Trump Organization sent Crocus Group counterparty questions about the, the quote, demographics of these prospective buyers in the Crocus area, the development of neighbor, neighboring parcels in Crocus City, and concepts for redesigning portions of the building. In August 2014, the Trump Organization requested specifications for a competing Marriott-branded tower being built in Crocus City. Beginning in September 4, 2014, the Trump Organization stopped responding in a timely fashion to, to correspondence and proposals from the Crocus Group. Communications between the two groups continued through November 2014 with decreasing frequency. What appears to be the last communication is dated November 24, 2014. The project appears not to have developed past the planning stage and no construction occurred. B, communications with IC Expert Investment Company and Georgie uh, looks like Rishnishkish, sorry about that. In the late summer of 2015, the Trump Organization received a new inquiry about pursuing a Trump Tower project to Moscow. In approximately, for approximately 2015, Felix Sater, a New York-based real estate advisor, contacted Michael Cohen, then executive vice president of the Trump Organization and special counsel to Donald J. Trump. Sater had previously worked with the Trump Organization and advised, advised it on a number of domestic and international projects. Sater had explored the possibility of a Trump Tower project in Moscow while working with the Trump Organization and therefore knew of the organization's general interest in com completing a deal there. Sater had also served as an informal agent of the Trump Organization in Moscow previously and it and accompanied Ivanka Trump and Donald Trump Jr. to Moscow in the mid-2000s. Sater contacted Cohen on behalf of IC Expert Investment, uh, a Russian real estate development corporation controlled by Andrei Valdimirovich Rosov. Sater had known Rosov since approximately 2007 and then 2014 had served as an agent on behalf of Rosov during Rosov's purchase of a building in New York City. Sater later contacted Rosov and proposed that IC Expert pursue a Tump Tower Moscow project in which LC Expert would license the name and brand the Trump Organization, but construct the building on its own. Sater worked on the deal with Rosov and another employee of IC Expert. Cohen was the only Trump Organization representative to, to negotiate directly with LC Expert or its agents. In approximately September 2015, Cohen obtained approval to negotiate with IC Expert from candidate Trump, who was then president of the Trump Organization. Cohen provided updates directly to Trump about the project to 2015 and into 2016, assuring him the project was continuing. Cohen also discovered the Trump Moscow project with a discuss the Trump Moscow project with Ivanka Trump 
as to design elements, parentheses, such as possible architects to use for the project, and Donald J. Trump Jr., parentheses, about his experience in Moscow and possible involvement in the project during the fall of 2015. Also during the fall of 2015, Cohen communicated about the Trump Moscow proposal with Giorgio Rastisi, a business executive who previously had involved in a development deal with a Trump organization in, in, in Batuan, uh, Georgia. Cohen stated that he spoke to Rastisi in part because Rastisi had purchased business ventures in Moscow, including a licensing deal with the Agalarov-owned Crocus Group. On September 22, 2015, Cohen forwarded a preliminary design study for the Trump Moscow project to Reda DC asking, quote, I look forward to your reply about this spectacular project in Moscow. Reda DC forwarded Cohen's email to an associate and wrote, quote, if we could organize the meeting in New York, New York at the highest level of the Russian government and Mr. Trump in this project would definitely receive the worldwide attention, end quote. On September 24, Rezidisky sent Cohen an attachment that he described as a proposed, quote, letter to the mayor of Moscow from Trump Organization, end quote, explaining that, quote, we need to send this letter to the mayor of Moscow, second guy in Russia. He is aware of the potential project and will pledge his support, end quote. In a second email to Cohen, sent the same day, Resonisti provided in the translation of the letter, which, is, which described the Trump Tower project, uh, project as a, quote, symbol of stronger economic, business, and cultural relationships between New York and Moscow, and therefore United States and the Russian Federation, end quote. On September 27, 2015, Residesi sent another email to Cohen proposing that the Trump Organization partner on the Trump Moscow project with Global Development Group LLC, which he described as being controlled by uh, Michel Pushisky, a Russian architect, and, and Simon Nishart Risi. Cohen told the office that he ultimately declined the proposal and instead continued to work with LC Expert, the companies represented by Felix Slater. C, letter of intent in context to Russian government, uh, parentheses date, dating October 2015 through 2016. One, Trump signs a letter on intent on behalf of the Trump Organization. Between approximately October 13, 2015 and November 2, November 15, the Trump Organization, through its subsidiary Trump Acquisitions LLC and LC Expert, completed a letter of intent for a Moscow, Trump Moscow project, the letter of intent signed by the Trump for the Trump Organization and Rosoff on behalf of IC Expert was, quote, intended to facilitate further discussions, end quote, in order to, quote, attempt to enter into a mutual, mutually agreeable, acceptable agreement, end quote, related to the Trump branded project in Moscow. The letter of intent contemplated a development with residential, hotel, commercial, and office components and called for, quote, approximately 250 class, first class, luxury residential condominiums, end quote, as well as, quote, one first class luxury hotel consisting of approximately 15 floors and containing not fewer than 150 hotel rooms, end quote. For the residential and commercial portions of the project, the Trump Organization would receive 1% and 5% of all condominium sales, plus 3% of all rental and other revenues. For the project's hotel portion, the Trump Organization would receive a base fee of 3% of gross operating revenues for the first five years and 4% thereafter, plus a separate incentive fee of 20% of operating profit. Under the letter of intent, the Trump Organization also would receive a $4 million upfront fee prior, price to, 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 prior to groundbreaking. Under these terms, the Trump Organization stood to earn substantial sums over the lifetime of the project without assuming significant liabilities or financing commitments. On November 3, 2015, 
The day after the Trump Organization transmitted the letter of intent, Sater emailed Cohen suggested, suggesting that the Trump Moscow project could be used to increase candidate Trump's chances of being elected, writing, and this is a quote, uh, buddy, our boy can become president of USA and we can engineer it. I will get all the, the Putin's team to buy in on this. I will manage this process. Michael, Putin gets, Putin gets on stage with Donald for ribbon cutting for Trump Tower and Donald owns the Republican nomination and possibly beats Hillary and our boy is in. We will manage this process better than anyone. You and I will get Donald and Valdemir on stage together very shortly. That's the game changer. Later that day, Sater followed up, quote, Donald doesn't stare down. He negotiates and understands the economic issues and Putin only, and only, and Putin only wants to deal with a pragmatic leader and a successful businessman and a good candidate for someone who knows how to negotiate. Quote, business, politics, whatever it, it, it all is, the same for someone who knows how to deal. I think I can get Putin to say that at the Trump, Trump Moscow Tower, if he says it, we own this election. Americans, America, America's most difficult adversary agreeing that Donald is a good guy to negotiate. We can own this election. Michael, my next steps are very sensitive with, with Putin's very, very close people. We can pull this off. Michael, let's go. Two boys from Brooklyn getting a USA president elected. This is good, really good. According to Cohen, he did not consider the political import of the Trump Moscow project to the 2016 U.S. presidential election at the time. Cohen also did not recall candidate Trump or anyone affiliated with the Trump campaign discussing implications of the Trump Moscow project with him. However, Cohen recalled conversations with Trump in which the candidate suggested that his campaign would be a significant infomercial for Trump branded properties. Two, post letter of intent context with individuals in Russia. Given the size of the Trump Moscow project, Sater and Cohen believe the project required approval, whether, whether expressed or implied, from the Russian national government, including from the presidential administration of Russia. Sater stated that he therefore began to contact the presidential administration through another Russian business contact. In early negotiations with the Trump Organization, Sater had alluded to the need for government approval in his attempts to set up meetings with Russian officials. On October 12, 2015, for example, Sater wrote to Cohen that, quote, all we need is Putin on board and we are golden, end quote, and that a meeting with Putin and a top deputy is tentatively set for the 14th of, of October, redacted, this meeting was coordinated by associates in Russia and that he had no direct interaction with the Russian government. Approximately a month later, after the letter of intent had been signed, Lana Uskara emailed Ivanka Trump on behalf of Urchova's then husband, Dmitry Klokov, in, to offer Klokov's assistance to the Trump campaign. Klokov was at the time director of external communications for PJSC Federal Grid Company of, the, of United Energy System, a large Russian ele electricity transmission company, and it had been previously employed as an aide and press secretary to Russia's energy minister. Ivanka Trump forwarded the email to Cohen. He told the office that after receiving this inquiry, he had conducted an internet search for Klokhov's name and concluded incorrectly that Klokov was a former Olympic weightlifter. Between November 18 and 19, 2015, Klokov and Cohen had at least one telephone call and exchanged several emails. Describing himself in emails to Cohen as a, quote, trusted person, end quote, who could offer the campaign political energy and, quote, synergy on a government level, end quote, Klokov recommended that Cohen travel to Russia to speak with him and, un, and, and an unidentified intermediary. Klokhov said that those conversations could facilitate a later meeting in Russia 
between the candidate and an individual Klockler described as, quote, a, our person of interest, end quote. In, in an email to the office, Orkovat later identified, quote, the person of interest as Russian President Vladimir Putin. In the telephone call and follow-up emails with Klokov, Cohen discussed his desire to use a near-term trip to Russia to do site surveys and talk over the Trump Bosco project with local developers. Cohen registered his willingness also to meet with Klokov in the unidentified intermediary, but was emphatic that all meetings in Russia involving him or candidate Trump, including a possible meeting between candidate Trump and Putin, would next be, quote, in conjunction with a development in an official visit, end quote, <coughs> with a Trump organization receiving a formal invitation to visit. Parentheses. Klokov had written previously that the visit by candidate Trump in Russia has to be informal. <coughs> Klokov has also previously recommended to Cohen that he separate their negotiations over a possible meeting between Trump and the person of interest from any existing business track. Reemphasizing that his outreach was not done on behalf of any business, Klokov added in second email to Cohen, and if publicized well, such a meeting could have phenomenal impact in the business dimension, and that the person of interest's most important support could have significant ramifications for the level of projects and their capacity. Cloco concluded by telling Cohen that there was no bigger warranty in any project than the consent of the person of interest. Cohen rejected the proposal, saying that currently our Letter of Intent developer is in talks with VP's chief of staff and arranging a formal invite for the two to meet. This email appears to be their final exchange and the investigation did not, ident did not identify evidence that Cohen brought Klokov's initial offer of assistance to the campaign's attention or that anyone associated with the Trump organization or the campaign dealt with Klokov at a later date. Cohen explained that he did not pursue the proposed meeting because he was already working on the Moscow project with, with Sater, who Cohen understood to have his own correct connections to the Russian government. By late December 2015, however, Cohen was complaining that Sater had not been able to use those connections to set up the promised meeting with, with Russian government officials. Cohen told Sater that he was, quote, setting up the meeting myself, end quote. On January 11, 2016, Cohen emailed um, the office of Dmitry Peskov, the Russian government's press secretary, indicating that he desired contact with Sergei Ivanov, uh, Putin's chief of staff. Cohen erroneously used the email address PR underscore P E S K O V A at P R P R E S S dot G O F dot R U instead of P R underscore P E S K O V A at P R P R E S S dot gov dot R U. So the email apparently did not go through. On January 14, 2016, Cohen emailed a different address, uh, info at PRPRESS dot GOV dot RU uh, with the following message. Dear Mr. Peskov, over the past few months, I have been working with a company based in Russia regarding the development of a Trump Tower Moscow project in Moscow City. Without getting into lengthy specifics, the communication between our two sides has stalled. As this project is too important, I am hereby requesting your assistance. I respectfully request someone, preferably you, Contact me so that I might discuss the specifics as well as arranging meetings with the appropriate individuals. I thank you in advance for your assistance and look forward to hearing from you soon. Two days later, Cohen sent an email to PR underscore P E S K O V A at PR P R E S S dot G O V dot R U, repeating his request to speak with Sergei Ivanov. Cohen testified to Congress and initially told the office that he did not recall receiving a response to his email inquiry and that he decided to terminate any further work on the Trump Moscow project 
as of January 2016. Cohen later admitted that these statements were false. Uh, in fact, Cohen had received and recalled receiving a response to his inquiry, and he continued to work on, an, on uh, he continued to work on and update candidate Trump on the project through as late as June 2016. On January 20th, 2016, Cohen received an email from Elena Polyakova, Peskov's personal assistant. Writing from her personal email account, Polyakova stated that she had been trying to reach Cohen and asked that he call her on the personal number that she provided. Shortly after receiving Polyakova's email, Cohen called and spoke to her for 20 minutes. Cohen described to Polyakova his position at the Trump Organization and outlined the proposed Trump Moscow project, including information about the Russian uh, counterparty with which the Trump Organization had partnered. Cohen requested assistance in moving the project forward, both in securing land to build the project and with financing. According to Cohen, Polyakova asked detailed questions and took notes, stating that she would need to follow up with others in Russia. Cohen could not recall any direct follow-up from Polyakova or, or, or from any other representative of the Russian government, nor did the office identify any evidence of direct follow-up. However, the day after Cohen's call with Polyakova, Sater texted Cohen uh, asking him to call me when you have a few minutes to chat. It's about Putin. They called today. Sater then sent a draft invitation for Cohen to visit Moscow to discuss the Trump Moscow project, along with a note to, quote, tell me if the letter is good as amended by me or make whatever changes you want and send it back to me, end quote. After a further round of edits on January 25th, 2016, Sater sent Cohen an invitation signed by uh, Andre uh, Ryabinsky of the company MHJ to travel to Moscow for a working visit about the prospects of development and the construction business in Russia, the various land plots available suited for construction of this enormous tower, and the opportunity to coordinate a follow-up visit to Moscow by Mr. Donald Trump. According uh, to Cohen, he elected not to travel at the time because of concerns about the lack of concrete proposals about land plots that could be considered as an option for the project. Uh, D, discussions about Russia travel by Michael Cohen or candidate Trump, December 2015 through June 2016. Um, one, um, Sater's overtures to Cohen uh, to travel to Russia. Uh, the, late, the, late, uh, the late January communication was neither the first nor the last time that Cohen contemplated visiting Russia in pursuit of the, Moscow, uh, of the Trump Moscow project. Beginning in late 2015, SATA repeatedly tried to arrange for Cohen and candidate Trump as representatives of the Trump Organization to travel to Russia to meet with Russian government officials and possible financing partners. In December 2015, Sater sent Cohen a number of emails about logistics for traveling to Russia for meetings. On December 19, 2015, Sater wrote, Please call me. I have uh, Evgeny uh, Devoskin on the other line. He needs a copy of, of your and Donald's passports. They need a scan of every page of the passports. Invitations and visas will be issued this week by VTB, Bank to discuss financing for Trump Tower in Moscow. Politically, neither Putin's office nor, uh, nor Ministry of Foreign Affairs cannot issue invite, so they are inviting um, commercially slash business. VTB is Russia's second biggest bank, and VTB Bank CEO Andrei Kostin will be at the meetings with, with Putin so that it is a business meeting, not, a, not political. We will be invited to Russia, uh, to Russian consulate this week to receive invite and have visa issued. In response, Cohen texted Sater an image of his own passport. Cohen told the office that at one point he requested a copy of candidate Trump's passport for Rona Graf, Trump's uh, executive assistant at the Trump organization, and that Graf later brought Trump's passport to Cohen's office. The investigation did not, however, establish that the passport was forwarded to Sater. Into the spring of 2016, Sater and Cohen continued to discuss a trip to Moscow in connection with the Trump Moscow project. 
On April 20th, 2016, Seda wrote Cohen, I quote, the people wanted to know when you were coming, end quote. On May 4th, 2016, Seda followed up. I had a chat with Moscow. Assuming the trip does happen, the question is before or after the convention. I, ha I said I believe, but don't know for sure that it's probably after the convention. Obviously, the pre-meeting trip, you only, can happen anytime you want, but the two big guys wear the question. I said I would confirm and revert. Let me know about if I was right by saying I believe after Cleveland and also when you want to speak to them and possibly fly over. Cohen responded, quote, my trip before Cleveland, Trump once he becomes the nominee after the convention, end quote. Uh, the day after this exchange, Sater tied Cohen's travel to Russia to the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, uh, an annual event attended by prominent Russian politicians and businessmen. Sater told the office that he was informed by a business associate that Peskov wanted to invite Cohen uh, to the forum. On May 5th, 2016, Sater wrote to Cohen, uh, Peskov would like to invite you as his guest to the St. Petersburg Forum, which is, Russia, which is Russia's Davos. It's June 16th through 19th. He, he wants to meet there with you and possibly introduce you to either Putin or Medvedev, uh, as they are not sure if I or, or both will be there. Uh, this is perfect. The entire business class of Russia will be there as well. He said anything you want to discuss, including dates and subjects, are on the table to discuss. The following day, Sater asked Cohen to confirm those dates uh, would work for him to travel. Cohen wrote back, quote, works for me, end quote. On June, 19, on June 9th, 2016, Sater sent Cohen a notice that he, Sater, was completing the badges for the forum, adding, quote, Putin is there on the 17th, very strong chance you will meet him as well, end quote. On June 13th, 2016, Sater forwarded Cohen an invitation to the forum signed by the director of, uh, of the Rose, uh, Rose Congress Foundation, the Russian entity organizing the forum. Sater also sent Cohen a Russian visa application and asked him to send two passport photos. According to Cohen, the invitation gave no indication that Peskov had been involved in inviting him. Cohen was concerned that Russian officials were not actually involved or were not interested in meeting with him, as Sater had alleged, and so he decided not to go to the forum. On June 14, 2016, Cohen met Sater in the lobby of the Trump Tower in New York and informed him that he would not be traveling at the time. Candidate Trump's opportunities to travel to Russia. The investigation identified evidence that during the, the period the Trump-Moscow project was under consideration, the possibility of candidate Trump visiting Russia arose in two contexts. First, in interviews with the office, Cohen stated that he discussed the subject of traveling to Russia with Trump twice, once in late 2015 and again in spring 2016. According to Cohen, Trump indicated a willingness to travel if it would assist the project significantly. On one occasion, Trump told Cohen to speak with then-campaign manager Corey Lewandowski to coordinate the candidate schedule. Cohen recalled that he spoke with Lewandowski, who suggested that they, would, they, were, that they speak again when Cohen had actual dates to evaluate. Cohen indicated, however, that he, knew, uh, that he knew that travel prior to the Republican National Com Convention would be impossible given the candidate's pre-existing commitments to the campaign. Second, like Cohen, Trump received and turned down an invitation to the, the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. In late December 2015, Mira Duma, a contact of Ivanka Trump's from the fashion industry, first passed al along invitations for Ivanka Trump and candidate Trump from Sergei Prikhodko, a deputy prime minister of the Russian Federation. On January 14, 2016, Rona Graf sent an email to Duma stating that Trump was, quote, honored to be asked to participate in the highly prestigious, end quote, forum event, but that he would, uh, quote, have to decline, end quote, the invitation given to his, quote, very grueling and full travel schedule, end quote, as a presidential candidate. Graf asked Duma, whether she recommended that Graf, quote, send a formal note to the deputy prime minister, end quote, declining the invitation. Duma replied that a formal note would be, quote,
quote, great, end quote. It does not appear that Graf prepared the note immediately. According to, a, to written answers from President Trump, Graf received an email from Deputy Prime Minister uh, Prichardko on March 17, 2016, uh, again inviting Trump to participate in the 2016 forum in St. Petersburg. Two weeks later, on March 31, 2016, Graf prepared for Trump's signature a two-paragraph letter declining the invitation. The letter stated that Trump, Trump's, quote, schedule has been extremely demanding, end quote, because of the presidential campaign, and that he, quote, already had several commitments uh, in the United States, end, end quote, for the time of the forum, but that he otherwise, quote, would have gladly given every consideration to attending such an important event, end quote. Graf forwarded the letter to uh, another executive assistant at the Trump Organization with instructions to print the document on letterhead for Trump to sign. At approximately the same time that the letter was being prepared, uh, Robert Forsman, a New York-based investment banker, began research, reaching, out to Graf's, re reaching out to Graf to secure an in-person meeting with candidate Trump. According to uh, Forsman, he had been asked by Anton Kobyakov, a Russian presidential aide involved with the uh, Ro 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 Congress Foundation to see if Trump could speak at the forum. Forsman first emailed Graf on March 31st, 2016, following a phone introduction brokered uh, through Trump business associate Mark Burnett, who produced the television show, the, who produced the television show The Apprentice. In his email, Forsman re re referenced his long-standing personal and professional expertise in Russia and Ukraine, uh, his work setting up early a private channel uh, between Vladimir Putin and former U.S. President George W. Bush, and an approach he had received from senior Kremlin officials about the candidate. Forsman asked Graf for a meeting with the candidate, uh, Corey, Lewand Corey Lewandowski, or another relevant person to discuss this and other concrete things. Forsman felt uncomfortable discussing over unsecure email. On April 4, 2016, Graf forwarded Forsman's meeting request to Jessica Machia, uh, another executive assistant to Trump. With no response forthcoming, Forsman twice sent reminders to Graf, first on April 26 and then on April 30, 2016. Graf sent an apology to Forsman um, and forwarded his April 26 email, as well as his initial March 2016 email, email to Lewandowski. On May 2, 2016, Graf forwarded Forsman's April 30 email, which suggested an alternative meeting with Donald Trump Jr. or Eric Trump so that Forsman could convey to them information that, quote, should be conveyed to the candidate personally or to someone the candidate absolutely trusts, end quote, to policy advisor Stephen Miller. No communications or other evidence obtained by the office indicate the Trump campaign learned that Forsman was reaching out to invite the candidate to the forum or that the campaign otherwise followed up with Forsman until, the, until after the election, when he interacted with the transition team as he pursued a possible position in the incoming administration. Uh, when interviewed by the office, Forsman denied that the specific approach from senior Kremlin officials noted uh, in his March 31st, 2016 email was anything other than Kobyakov's invitation to uh, Ross Congress. According to Forsman, the concrete things he referred to um, in the same email were a combination of the invitation itself, Forsman's personal perspective on the invitation, and uh, Russia policy in general, uh, and details of Ukraine's plan supported by a U.S. think tank, East-West Institute. Forsman uh, told the office that Kobyakov had extended similar invitations through him to another Republican presidential cam candidate and one other politician. Forsman also said that Kobyakov had asked Forsman to invite Trump to speak after, that, after the other presidential candidate withdrew from the race and the other politician's participation did not work out. Finally, Forsman claimed that he, to have no plans to establish a back channel involving Trump, stating the reference to his involvement in the Bush-Putin back channel was meant to burnish his credentials to the campaign. Horstman co uh, commented that he would not, uh, he, he had not recognized any of the experts announced at, as Trump's foreign policy team in March 2016 and wanted to secure an in-person meeting with the candidate to share his professional 
background and policy views, including that Trump should decline Kobyakov's invitation to speak at the forum. George Papadopoulos. George Papadopoulos was a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign from March 2016 to October 2016. In late April 2016, Papadopoulos was told by London-based professor Joseph Mifsud, immediately after Mifsud's return from a trip to Moscow, that the Russian government had obtained, quote, dirt, end quote, on candidate Clinton, on candidate Clinton in the form of thousands of emails. One week later, on May 6, 2016, Papadopoulos suggested to a representative of a foreign government that the Trump campaign had received indications from the Russian government that it could assist the campaign through the anonymous release of information that would be damaging to candidate Clinton. Papadopoulos shared information about Russian, quote, dirt, end quote, with people outside of the campaign, and the office investigated whether he also provided uh, to a campaign official. Papadopoulos and the campaign officials with whom he interacted told the office they did not recall Papadopoulos passed them the information. Throughout the relevant period of time and for several months thereafter, Papadopoulos worked with Mifsud and two Russian nationals to arrange meetings between the campaign and the Russian government. That meeting never came to pass. Origins of campaign work. In March 2016, Papadopoulos became a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign. As early as the summer of 2015, he had sought a role as a policy advisor to the campaign, but in a September 30, 2015 email, he was told that the campaign was not hiring policy advisors. In late 2015, Papadopoulos, assisted a paid, uh, Papadopoulos obtained a paid position on the campaign of Republican presidential candidate Ben Carson. Although Carson remained in the presidential race until early March 2016, Papadopoulos had stopped actively working for his campaign by early February 2016. At the time, Papadopoulos reached out to a contact at the London Center of International Law Practice, LCILP, which billed itself as a, quote, unique institution comprising high-level professional international law practitioners dedicated to the advancement of global legal knowledge and the practice of international law, end quote. Papadopoulos said that he had finished uh, his role uh, with the Carson campaign and asked uh, if LCILP was hiring. In early February, Papadopoulos agreed to join LCILP and arrived in London to begin work. As he was taking his position at LCILP, Papadopoulos contacted Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski via LinkedIn and email campaign uh, official Michael Glasner about his interest in joining the Trump campaign. On March 2, 2016, Papadopoulos sent Glasner another message reiterating his interest. Glasner passed along word of Papadopoulos' interest to another campaign official, Joy Lutz, uh, who notified Papadopoulos by email that she had been told by Glasner to introduce Papadopoulos to Sam Clovis, the Trump campaign's national co-chair and policy advisor. At the time, Papadopoulos' March 2 email, the media was criticizing the Trump campaign for lack of experience foreign policy or national security advisors within its ranks. To address that issue, the senior campaign officials asked Clovis to put a foreign policy team together on short notice. After receiving Papadopoulos' name from Lutz, Clovis performed a Google search on Papadopoulos, learned that he had worked at the Hudson Institute, and believed that he had credibility on, on energy issues. On March 3, 2016, Clovis arranged to speak with Papadopoulos by phone to discuss Papadopoulos' joining the campaign as a foreign policy advisor. And on March 6, 2016, the two spoke. Papadopoulos recalled that Russia was mentioned as a topic, and he understood from the conversation that Russia would be an important aspect of the campaign's foreign policy. At the end of the conversation, Clovis offered Papadopoulos a role as a foreign policy advisor to the campaign, and Papadopoulos accepted the offer. Approximately uh, an, an initial Russia-related context. Approximately a week after signing on as foreign policy advisor, Papadopoulos traveled uh, to Rome, Italy, as part of his duties with LCILP. The purpose of the trip uh, was to meet officials affiliated with Link Campus University, a for-profit institution headed by a former Italian government official. And during the visit, Papadopoulos was introduced to Joseph Mifsud. Uh, Mifsud uh, is a Maltese national who worked as a professor at the London Academy of Diplomacy in London, England. Uh, although Misford worked out of, out of London and was affiliated with LCILP, 
the encounter in Rome was the first time the Papadopoulos had met him. Uh, Mifsud maintained various Russian contacts while living in London, as described further below. Among his contacts was, was a redaction, a one-time employee of the IRA, uh, the entity that carried out the Russian social media campaign, see Volume 1, Section 2, Supra. <clears throat> in January and February 2016, Mifsud discussed possibly meeting in Russia. Uh, the uh, investigation did not identify evidence of their meeting. Later in the spring of 2016, there's a redaction, uh, was also in contact with uh, another redaction that was linked uh, to an employee of Russian Ministry of Defense. And that account had overlapping contacts with a group of Russian military controlled uh, Facebook accounts that included accounts used by, to promote the DC leaks releases in the course of the GRU's hack and release operations, see Volume 1, Section 3, B, B1, Supra. According to Papadopoulos, Ms. Hood at first seemed in, uninterested in Papadopoulos when they met in Rome. After Papadopoulos informed Ms. Hood about his role in the Trump campaign, however, Ms. Hood appeared to take greater interest in Papadopoulos. Uh, the two discussed Ms. Hood's European and Russian contacts and had a general discussion about Russia. Ms. Hood also offered to introduce Papadopoulos to European leaders and others with contacts to the Russian government. Papadopoulos told the office that Mifsud's claim of substantial connections with the Russian government officials interested in Papadopoulos, <coughs> who thought that such connections could increase his importance as a policy advisor to the Trump campaign. On March 17th, Papadopoulos uh, returned to London. Four days later, candidate Trump publicly named him as a member of the Foreign Policy and National Security Advisory Team chaired by Senator Jeff Sessions, describing Papa, Papadopoulos as, and I quote, an oil and energy consultant. And, and, and I quote again, excellent guy. On March 24th, 2016, Papadopoulos met with Mifsud in London. Mifsud was accompanied by a Russian female named Olga Polonskaya. Mifsud introduced Polonskaya as a former student of his who had connections to Vladimir Putin. Papadopoulos understood at the time that Polonskaya may have been Putin's niece, but later learned that this was not true. Uh, during the meeting, Polonskaya offered to help Papadopoulos establish contacts in Russia and stated that the Russian ambassador in London was a friend of hers. Based on this interaction, Papadopoulos expected Mifsud and Polonskaya to introduce him to the Russian ambassador in London, but that did not occur. Following this meeting, following his meeting with Mifsud, Papadopoulos sent an email to the members of the Trump campaign's foreign policy advisory team. The subject line of the message was, and I quote, meeting with Russian leadership, including Putin, end quote. The message stated in pertinent part, I just finished a very productive lunch with a good friend of mine, Joseph Mifsud, the director of the London Academy of Diplomacy who introduced me to both Putin's niece and the Russian ambassador in London, who also acts as the deputy foreign minister. The topic of the lunch was to arrange a meeting between us and the Russian leadership to discuss U.S.-Russia ties under President Trump. They are keen to host us in a, quote, neutral, unquote, city or directly in Moscow. They said the leadership, including Putin, is ready to meet with us and Mr. Trump should there be interest. Waiting for everyone's thoughts on moving forward with this very important issue. <clears throat> Papadopoulos' uh, message came at a time when Clovis perceived a shift in the campaign's approach toward Russia, from one of engaging with Russia through the NATO framework and taking a strong stance on Russian aggr aggression in Ukraine. And then there's a redaction. Uh, Clovis' response to Papadopoulos, however, did not reflect that shift. Replying to Papadopoulos and other members of the foreign policy uh, advisory team copied on the initial email, Clovis wrote, this is the most informative. Let me work it through the campaign. No commitments until we see how this plays out. My thought is that we probably should not go forward with any meetings with the Russians until we have had occasion to sit with our NATO allies 
especially France, Germany, and Great Britain. We need to reassure our allies that we are not going to advance anything with Russia until we have everyone on the same page. More thoughts later today. Great work. March 31, Foreign Policy Team Meeting. The campaign held a meeting of the Foreign Policy Advisory Team with Senator Sessions and candidate Trump approximately one week later on March 31, 2016 in Washington, D.C. The meeting, which was intended to generate press coverage for the campaign, took place at the Trump International Hotel. Papadopoulos flew to Washington for the event. At the meeting, Senator Sessions sat at one end of the Oval Table while Trump sat at the other. As reflected in the photograph below, which was posted to Trump's Instagram account, Papadopoulos sat between the two, two seats to Sessions' left. During the meeting, each of the newly announced foreign policy advisors introduced themselves and briefly described their areas of experience and expertise. Papadopoulos spoke about his previous work in the energy sector and then brought up a potential meeting with Russian officials. Specifically, Papadopoulos told the group that he had learned through his contacts in London that Putin wanted to meet with the candidate, uh, with candidate Trump, and that these connections could help arrange that meeting. Trump and Sessions both reacted to Papadopoulos' statement. Papadopoulos and campaign advisor J.D. Gordon told investigators in an interview that he had a, quote, crystal clear, quote, recollection of the meeting, have stated that um, Trump was interested in and receptive to the idea of meeting with Putin. Papadopoulos understood Sessions to be sim similarly supportive of his efforts to arrange a meeting. Gordon and two other attendees, however, recall that Sessions generally opposed the proposal, though they differ in their accounts of the concerns he voiced or the strength uh, of the opposition that he expressed. George Papadopoulos learns that Russia has dirt in the form of Clinton emails. Whatever Sessions' precise words at the March 31 meeting, Papadopoulos did not understand Sessions or anyone else in the Trump campaign to have directed that he refrain from making further efforts to arrange a meeting between the campaign and the Russian government. To the contrary, Papadopoulos told the office that he understood the campaign to be supportive of his efforts to arrange such a meeting. Accordingly, when he returned to London, Papadopoulos resumed those efforts. Throughout April 2016, Papadopoulos continued to correspond with, meet with, and seek Russia contacts through Mifsud and at times Polonskaya. For example, within a week of her initial March 24 meeting with him, Polonskaya attempted to send Papadopoulos a text message, which email exchanges showed to have been drafted or edited by Mifsud, addressing Papadopoulos's, quote, wish to engage with the Russian Federation, end quote. When Papadopoulos learned uh, from Mifsud that Polonskaya tried to message him, he sent her an email seeking another meeting. Polonskaya responded the next day that she was, quote, back in St. Petersburg, but would be very pleased to support Papadopoulos' initiatives between our two countries, end quote, and, quote, to meet him again, end quote. Papadopoulos stated in reply that he thought, quote, a good step would be to introduce him to, quote, the Russian ambassador in London, and that he would like to talk to the ambassador or anyone else you recommend about a, about a potential foreign policy trip to Russia. Mifsud, uh, who had been copied on the email exchanges, replied on the morning of April 11, 2016. He wrote, and I quote, this has already been agreed. I am flying to Moscow on the 18th uh, for a Valde meeting, plus other meetings at the Duma. We will talk tomorrow, end quote. Two bodies refer referenced by Mifsud are part, of the, uh, are part of or associated with the Russian government. The Duma is a Russian legislative assembly, while, uh, the, the, while Valde re uh, refers to the Valde Discussion Club, a Moscow-based group that is, quote, um, close to Russia, Russia's foreign policy establishment, end quote. Papadopoulos thanked Mifsud and said that he would see him tomorrow. For her part, Polonskaya responded that she had, quote, already alerted my personal links to our conversation and your request, end quote. And Quote, we are all very excited at the possibility of a good relationship with Mr. Trump, end quote. And that, quote, the Russian Federation would love to welcome him once his uh, candidature would be officially announced. 
Papadopoulos's and Mifsud's mentions of seeing uh, each other uh, tomorrow referenced uh, a meeting that the two had scheduled for the next morning, April 12, 2016, at the Andaz Hotel in London. Papadopoulos acknowledged the meeting during interviews with the office and records from Papadopoulos' UK cell phone and his internet search history all indicate that the meeting took place. Following the meeting, Mifsud traveled as planned to Moscow. On April 18, 2016, while in Russia, Mifsud introduced Papadopoulos over an email to Ivan Timofeev, a member of the Russian International Affairs Council, RIAC. Mifsud had described Timofeev as having connections with the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, MFA, the executive entity in Russia responsible for Russia's foreign relations. Over the next several weeks, Papadopoulos and Tim Timofeev had multiple conversations over Skype and email about setting, quote, the groundwork, uh, end quote, for a potential meeting between the campaign and Russian government officials. Papadopoulos told the office that uh, uh, that on one Skype call, he believed that his connection with Timofeev was being monitored or supervised by an unknown third party because Timofeev spoke in an official manner and Papadopoulos heard odd noises on the line. Timofeev also told Papadopoulos in an April 25, 2016 email that he had just spoken to Igor Ivanov, the president of RIAC and former foreign minister of Russia and conveyed Ivanov's advice about how best to arrange a Moscow visit. After a stop in Rome, Mifsud returned to England on April 25, 2016. The next day, Papadopoulos met Mifsud for breakfast at the Andes Hotel, same location as their last meeting. During that meeting, Mifsud told Papadopoulos that he had met with high-level Russian government officials during the, his recent trip to Moscow. Mifsud also said on that trip, he learned that the Russians had obtained, quote, dirt, end quote, on candidate Hillary Clinton. As Papadopoulos later stated to the FBI, Mifsud said that the, quote, dirt, end quote, was in the form of, quote, emails of Clinton, end quote, and that they have, quote, they have thousands of emails, end quote. On May 6, 2016, 10 days after the meeting with Mifsud, Papadopoulos suggested to a representative of a foreign government that the Trump campaign had received indications from the Russian government that it could assist the campaign through the anonymous release of information that would be damaging to Hillary Clinton. Russia related communications with the campaign. While he was discussing with his foreign contacts a potential meeting of campaign officials with Russian government officials, Papadopoulos kept campaign officials apprised of his efforts. On April 25th, 2016, the day after the day before Mifsud told Papadopoulos about the emails, Papadopoulos wrote to a senior policy advisor, Stephen Miller, that, quote, the Russian government has an open invitation by Putin for Mr. Trump to meet him when he is ready, end quote. And that, quote, the advantage of being in London is that these governments tend to speak a bit more openly in neutral cities, end quote. On April 27, 2016, after his meeting with Mifsud, Papadopoulos wrote a second message to Miller stating that, quote, some, of, some interesting messages were coming in from Moscow about a trip when the time is right, end quote. The same day, Papadopoulos sent a similar email to campaign manager Corey Lewandowski, telling Lewandowski that Papadopoulos had, quote, been receiving a lot of calls over the last month about Putin wanting to host Trump uh, and the team when the time is right, end quote. Papadopoulos' Russia-related communications with campaign officials continued throughout the spring and summer of 2016. On May 4, 2016, he forwarded to Lewandowski an email from Timofeev raising the possibility of a meeting in Moscow, asking Lewandowski whether that was, quote, something we want to move forward with, end quote. The next day, Papadopoulos forwarded the same Timofeev email to Sam Clovis, adding to, to, adding to the top of the email, quote, Russia update, end quote. He included the same email in a t May 21, 2016 message to senior campaign officials, the senior campaign official Paul Manafort, under the subject line, quote, request from Russia to meet with Mr. Trump, end quote, stating that, quote, Russia has, has been eager to meet Mr. Trump for quite some time and have been reaching out to me um, to discuss Manafort forwarded the message to another campaign official without including Papadopoulos and stated, quote, let's discuss. 
We need someone to communicate that Trump is not doing these trips. It should be someone low level in the campaigns so as not to send any signal, end quote. On, on June 1, uh, 2016, Papadopoulos replied to an earlier email chain with Lewandowski about a Russia vi visit asking if Lewandowski, quote, wanted to have a call about this topic, end quote, and whether, quote, we were following up with it. After Lewandowski told Papadopoulos to, quote, connect with Clovis because he was, quote, running point, Papadopoulos emailed Clovis that, quote, the Russian MFA, end quote, was asking um, him, quote, if Mr. Trump was interested in visiting Russia at some point, end quote. Papadopoulos wrote in an email that he, quote, wanted to pass the info along to you for you to decide what's best to do with it and what message I should send or ignore. After several email and Skype exchanges with Tinamafiv, Papadopoulos sent one more email to Lewandowski on June 19, 2016. Lewandowski's last day as a campaign manager. The email stated that the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs had contacted him and asked whether if Mr. Trump could not travel to Russia, a campaign representative such as Papadopoulos could attend the meeting. Papadopoulos told Lewandowski that he was, open quote, willing to make the trip off the record if it's in the interest of Mr. Trump in the campaign to meet specific people, close quote. Following Lewandowski's departure from the campaign, Papadopoulos communicated with Clovis and Walid Frazes, another member of the foreign policy advisory team, about off-the-record meetings between the campaign and Russian government officials or with Papadopoulos' other Russian connections, Ms. Fudd and Timofeev. Papadopoulos also interacted directly with Clovis and Ferris in connection with the summit of the Transatlantic Parliamentary Group on Counterterrorism, or TAG, a group for which Ferris was co-secretary general. On July 16, 2016, Papadopoulos, Papadopoulos attended the TAG summit in Washington, D.C., where he sat next to Clovis, as reflected in the paragraphs below, period. Although Clovis claimed to have no recollection of attending the TAG summit, Papadopoulos remembered discussing Russia in the foreign policy trip with Clovis and Ferris during the event. Papadopoulos' recollection is consistent with email sent before and after the TAG summit. The pre-summit messages included a July 11, 2016 email in which Ferris suggested a meeting Papadopoulos the day after the summit to chat, and a July 12th message in the same chain in which Ferris advised Papadopoulos that other Summit attendees, open quote, are very nervous about Russia, so beware, close quotes. Ten days after the summit, Papadopoulos sent an email to Ms. Fudd listing Ferris and Clovis as other participants in a potential meeting at the London Academy of Diplomacy. Finally, Papadopoulos' recollection is also consistent with handwritten notes from the journal that he kept at the time. Those notes, which are reprinted in part below, appear to refer to potential September 16 meetings in London with representatives of the office of Putin and suggest that Faris, Clovis, and Papadopoulos would attend without official, the official backing of the campaign. Later communications indicated that Clovis determined that he could not travel. On August 15, 2016, Papadopoulos emailed Clovis that he had received requests from multiple foreign governments, even Russia, for closed-door workshop consultations abroad and asked whether there was still interest from Clovis, Ferris, and Papadopoulos to go on that trip. Clovis copied Ferris on 
his response, which said that he could not travel before the election, but that he would encourage Papadopoulos and what lead to make the trips if it is feasible. Papadopoulos was dis dismissed from the Trump campaign in early October 2016 after an interview he gave to the Russian news agency Interfax generated adverse publicity. Papadopoulos admitted telling at least one individual outside of the campaign, specifically the then Greek foreign minister, about Russia's obtaining Clinton-related emails. In addition, a different foreign government informed the FBI that 10 days after meeting with Ms. Foote in late 20, April 2016, Papadopoulos suggested that the Trump campaign had received indications from the Russian government that it would assist the campaign through anonymous, anonymously released of information that would be damaging to Hillary Clinton. This conversation occurred after the GRU spearished Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta and sold his emails. The GRU hacked into the DCCC and DNC. Such disclosures raise questions about whether Papadopoulos informed any Trump campaign officials about the email. When interviewed, Papadopoulos and the campaign officials who interacted with him told the office that they could not recall Papadopoulos is sharing the information that Russia had obtained dirt on candidate Clinton in the form of emails or that Russia could assist the campaign through the anonymous release of information about Clinton. Papadopoulos stated that he could not clearly recall having told anyone on the campaign and wavered about whether he accurately remembered an incident in which Clovis had been upset after hearing Papadopoulos tell Clovis that Papadopoulos thought they have her emails. The campaign officials who interacted or corresponded with Papadopoulos had similarly stated with varying degrees of certainty that he did not tell them Senior policy advisor Stephen Miller, for example, did not remember hearing anything from Papadopoulos or Clovis about Russia having emails of or dirt on candidate Clinton. Clovis stated that he did not recall anyone, including Papadopoulos, having given them non-public information that a foreign government might be in possession of material damaging to Hillary Clinton. Redaction. Grand jury, redaction, grand jury. Redaction, grand jury. No documentary evidence and nothing in the email, email accounts or other communication facilities reviewed by the office show that Papadopoulos shared his information with the campaign. Additional George Papadopoulos contact. The office investigated another Russian-related contact with Papadopoulos. The office was not fully, fully able to explore the contact because the individual at issue, Sergei Milan, remained out of the country since the inception of our investigation and declined to meet with members of the office despite our repeated efforts to obtain an interview. Papadopoulos first connected with Milan via LinkedIn on July 15, 2016. Shortly after Papadopoulos had attended the TAG summit with Clovis, Milan, an American citizen who is a native, native of Belarus, introduced himself as president of the New York-based Russian-American Chamber of Commerce and claimed that he thought that pos the position he had insider knowledge and direct access to the top hierarchy in Russian politics. Papadopoulos asked Timofey whether he had heard of Milan. Although Timofey said no, Papadopoulos then met Milan in New York City. 
The meeting took place on July 30th and August 1st, 2016. Afterwards, Milan invited Papadopoulos to attend and potentially speak at two international energy conferences, including one that was to be held in Moscow in September 2016. Papadopoulos ultimately did not attend either conference. On July 31st, 2016, following his first in-person meeting with Milan, Papadopoulos emailed Trump campaign official Bo Deniskic to say that he had been contacted by some leaders of Russian American voters here in the US about their interest in voting for Mr. Trump and to ask whether he should put you in touch with other groups, Russian Chamber of Commerce. Denisik thanked Papadopoulos for taking the initiative but asked him to hold off with the outreach of Russian Americans because too many articles had already portrayed the campaign. Then campaign chairman Paul Manafort and candidate Trump as being pro-Russian. On August 23rd, 2016, Milan sent a Facebook message to Papadopoulos promising, promising that he would share with you a disruptive technology that might be instrumental in your political work for the campaign. Papadopoulos claimed to have no recollection of this matter. On November 9th, 2016, shortly after the election, Papadopoulos arranged to meet Milan in Chicago to discuss business opportunities, including potential work with Russian billionaires who are not under sanctions. The meeting took place on November 14, 2016, at the Trump Hotel and Tower in Chicago. According to Papadopoulos, the two men discussed partnering on business deals, but Papadopoulos perceived that Milan's attitude towards him changed when Papadopoulos stated that he was only pursuing private sector opportunities and was not interested in a job in the administration. The two remained in contact, however, and had extended online discussions about possible business opportunities in Russia. The two also arranged to meet at a Washington, D.C. par when both attended Trump's inauguration in late January 2017. Carter Page. Carter Page worked for the Trump campaign from January 2016 to September 2016. He was formally and publicly announced as a foreign policy advisor by the candidate in March 2016. Page had lived in Russia, had lived and worked in Russia, and had been approached by Russian intelligence officers <coughs> several years before he volunteered for the Trump campaign. During his time with the campaign, Page advocated pro-Russian foreign policy positions and traveled to Moscow on his personal capacity. Russian intelligence officials had formed relationships with Page in 2008 and 2013. And Russian officials may have focused on Page in 2016 because of his affiliation with a campaign. However, the investigation did not establish that Page coordinated with the Russian government in its efforts to interfere with the 2016 presidential campaign. Background. Before he began working for the campaign in January 2016, Page had substantial prior experience studying Russian policy issues and living and working in Moscow. From 2004 to 2007, Page was deputy branch manager of Merrill Lynch's Moscow office. There he worked on transactions involving Russian energy company Gazprom and came to know Gazprom's Deputy Chief Financial Officer, Sergiev Yatsenko. In 2009, 2008, Page founded Global Energy Capital LLC, GEC, an investment management advisory firm focused on the energy sector in emerging markets. 
redaction, grand jury. The company otherwise had no source of income and Page was forced to draw down his life savings to support himself and pursue his business venture. Page asked Yasenko to work with him at GEC as a senior advisor on a contingency basis. Grand jury redaction. In 2008, Page met Alexander Bulatov, a Russian government official who worked at the Russian consulate in New York. Page later learned that Bulatov was a Russian intelligence officer. Grand jury redaction. In 2013, Viktor Podonovny, another Russian intelligence officer, working covertly in the United States under diplomatic cover, formed a relationship with Page. Podivny met Page in energy, at an energy symposium in New York City and began to exchange emails with him. Podonovny and Page also met in person on multiple occasions during which Page offered his outlook on the future of the energy industry and provided documents to Badovny about the energy business. In a recorded conversation on April 8, 2013, Badovny told another intelligence officer that Page was interested in business opportunities in Russia. In Badovny's words, Page got hooked on Gazprom in thinking that if they have a project, he could rise up. Maybe he can. It's obvious that he wants to earn a lot of money. But Dovney said that he had led Page on by feeding him empty promises that Padovny would use his Russian business connections to help Page. But Dovney told the other intelligence officer that his method of recruiting foreign surface, foreign sources was to promise them favors and then discard them once he obtained relevant information from them. In 2015, Padovny and two other Russian intelligence officers were charged with a conspiracy to act as an unregistered agent of a foreign government. The criminal complaint detailed Padovny's interaction with and conversations about Page who was identified only as male one. Based on the criminal complaint's description of the interaction, Page was aware that he was the individual described as male one. Page later spoke with Russian government officials at the United Nations General Assembly and identified himself so that the official could understand that he was male one from the Donovny's complaint. Page told the official that he didn't do anything grand jury redaction. In interviews with the FBI before the office opening, Page acknowledged that he understood that the individual he had associated with were members of the Russian intelligence services. But he stated that he had only provided immaterial, non-public information to them and that he did not view this relationship as a back channel. Page told investigating agents that the more immaterial, non-public information I give them, the better for this country. In January 2016, Page began volunteering on an informal, unpaid basis for the Trump campaign after Ed Cox, a state Republican Party official, introduced Page to the Trump campaign officials. Page told the office that his goal in working on the campaign was to help candidate Trump improve relations with Russia. To that end, Page emailed campaign officials offering his thoughts on U.S.-Russia relations, prepared talking points and briefing memos on Russia, and proposed that candidate Trump meet with President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. In communications with the campaign officials, Page also repeatedly touted his high-level contacts in Russia and his ability to forge connections between candidate Trump and senior Russian government officials. For example, on January 30, 2016, Page sent an email to senior campaign officials stating that he had spent the past week in Europe 
and had been in discussions with some individuals with close ties to the Kremlin who recognized that Trump could have a game-changing effect in bringing the end to the new Cold War. The email, the email stated that through his discussions with these high-level contacts, Page believed that a direct meeting in Moscow between Mr. Trump and Putin could be arranged. Page closed the email by criticizing U.S. actions on Russia. Grand jury redaction. On March 21st, 2016, candidate Putin formally and publicly identified Page as a member of his foreign policy team to advise on Russia in the energy sector. Over the next several months, Page continued providing policy-related work product to the campaign officials. For example, in April 2016, Page provided feedback on an outside, on an outline for a foreign policy speech that the candidate gave at the Mayflower Hotel. See Volume 1, Section 4, Infra A4. In May 16, in May 2016, Page prepared an outline of an energy policy speech for the campaign and then traveled to Bismarck, North Dakota to watch the candidate deliver the speech. Chief Policy Advisor Sam Clavis expressed appreciation for Page's work and praised his work on the other campaign to the other campaign officials. Page's affiliation with the with the Trump's campaign took on a higher profile and drew the attention of Russian officials after the candidate named him a foreign policy advisor. As a result, in late April 2016, Page was invited to give a speech at the July 2016 commencement ceremony at the new economic school in Moscow, or NES. The NES Commitment Ceremony generally featured high-profile speakers. For example, President Barack Obama delivered a commencement address at the school in 2009. NES officials told the office that the interest in inviting Page to speak at NES was based entirely on his status as a Trump campaign advisor who served as a candidate's Russia expert. Andres Kovic, an associate of Pages and an assistant professor at the Higher School of Economics in Russia, recommended that NES Rector Sholma Weber invite Page to give the commencement address based on his connections to the Trump campaign. Denis Klimentov, an employee of NES, said that when Russians learned of Page's involvement in the Trump campaign in March 2016, the excitement was palpable. Weber recalled that in summer of 2016, there was substantial interest in the Trump campaign in Moscow, and he felt that bringing a member of the campaign to the school would be beneficial. Page was eager to accept the invitation to speak at NES and he sought approval from the Trump campaign officials to make the trip. On May 16, 2016, while at their request was still under consideration, Page emailed Clovis J.D., Gordon, and Walid Faris and suggested that candidate Trump take his place to speak at the commencement ceremony in Moscow. On June 19, 2016, Page followed up again to request approval to speak at the NES event and to reiterate that NES would love to have Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump speak at his, this annual celebration in Page's place. Campaign manager Corey Lewandowski responded the same day saying, if you want to do this, it would be outside your role with a JDT for president, president's campaign. I'm certain Mr. Trump will not be able to attend. In early 2016, Page traveled to Russia for the NES events. On July 15, July 5th, 2016, Denis Klimetov, copying his brother Dmitry Klimetov, 
emailed Maria Traknova, the director of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs Information and Press Department about Page's visit and his connection to the Trump campaign. Denis Klimatov said in the email that he wanted to draw the Russian government's attention to Page's visit in Moscow. His message to Hakarova <clears throat> continued. Page is Trump's advisor on foreign policy. He is a known businessman. He used to work in Russia. If you have any questions, I will be happy to help you contact him. Dmitry Klimatov then contacted Russian press secretary Dmitry Preskov about Page's visit to see if Peskov wanted to introduce Page to any, of Russian, any other Russian government officials. The following day, Peskov responded to what appears to have been the same Denis Klimitov Zaharova email thread. Peskov wrote, I have read about Page. Specialists say that he is far from being the main one, so better not initiate a meeting in the Kremlin. On July 7, 2016, Page delivered the first of his two speeches in Moscow.